our soul has a greater need for patience. In 1986, the symptoms Father Paisios had been having with a hernia became worse. He was in such great pain that he could hardly walk, sit, or remain in a standing position. Only by lying on his side did he find a little respite. As a struggler familiar with pain, however, he had reached the state of loving the pain associated with illness as much as he loved the effort associated with asceticism. In a letter dated 1985, the elder had written, It seems that our soul has a greater need for patience and doxology to God in times of pain, rather than extensive physical struggles with a body of steel that might boast without realizing it of winning paradise with his sword. Let me set aside the previous years and just look at this past year, during half of which I suffered from a slipped disc and could do neither the prostrations I used to do nor take care of myself, and yet had to minister to the steady flow of people who were in pain. Now something has appeared that is rather hard, which might be a hernia. It bothers me and it hurts, but I boast of it, because not only does Christ know of it, but he also knows that it helps me, which is why he leaves it be. As time passed, the hernia grew larger and became the size of a small melon. The saint, however, continued to be an indefatigable worker who ministered to the people and an undaunted athlete in ascetic struggles. Despite the heavy snow, he even shoveled a path from the keli to the fence, holding the shovel with one hand and the hernia with the other. During that time, many observed that he was very pale and drenched in sweat. It was because of the great pain and the effort to conceal it. There were times when he had to lay down on the ground or on two boards while talking with some people in order to meet their need. As soon as he saw an anguished person, he forgot his own pain. It is not that I become well, he noted, nor that God provides a miracle, but the miracle happens when one participates in the pain of the other. You see, when Christians were martyred for their faith, it was their great love for Christ which overcame their physical pain. The saint even forgot his pain in the face of the pain of animals. One day when laborers were using mules to transport logs in the area of Panaguda, he saw a mule that was so overloaded that it had fallen to its knees. He immediately ran to relieve the animal of its burden. You don't have to be careful, you have a hernia, shouted a monk who was there. Since you do not have a hernia, why didn't you run, he asked. I was afraid it might kick me, he replied. Hey, listen, an animal, even a wolf, when it has somehow become stuck, asks for help, the saint remarked. Once when he related that incident, he also added, When a person is concerned only about himself, he is not a human being. What's the point of living such a life? I would rather die a thousand times. He did not want to see a doctor. That would be an easy solution, he said. I am trying to earn substantial wages from this situation. One doctor advised him to wear a special support belt, and Father Paisios responded, Bring me one to see whether it will hinder my movement. When the doctor brought it, he put it on and began doing deep prostrations. Joyfully he said, It does not hinder me. I'll keep it. From that time on, he made his own, quote, sashes, unquote, as he called them, using old pieces of cloth, elastic cloth bands, and socks. Thus, as the struggler that he was, he devised various ways to continue his spiritual disciplines. He even attempted to do deep prostrations by using a crate in order to avoid kneeling all the way to the floor. To a young man, he said, What tremendous torture this is! I cannot even make prostrations. Nonetheless, if you make prostrations while suffering from physical pain, you receive a stamp. When you are young, you ought to gather stamps, because when you grow old, you will not be able to receive stamps, and so your pension will be small. He continued to do the 48, 300 
not Combeschini, which is 14,400, which he usually did each night with small prostrations in the following manner. He did one 300 knot combeschini with small prostrations, and then he did two 300 knot combeschini without prostrations while standing upright and leaning on the stasidi. He repeated that pattern until the total number had been completed. He continued to read the Psalter in a standing position while leaning on two forked branches that he used like crutches. He often held the hernia with one hand and the Psalter with the other while the unbearable pain caused tears to flow from his eyes. I hit the devil with the artillery, he confided. Throughout the day, I hit him with the Psalter, and at night, I hit him with the Jesus Prayer. The devil became rabid. The disablement from the hernia was a demonic attack. God, however, permitted it to see what I would do in response. What a great matter! Tears of pain flow from my eyes, but that is when God bestows great consolation. At the Pomog Villages of Thrace Having received persistent invitations from the Archbishop of Sinai, Father Paisios bestirred himself to visit Sinai yet again in 1987. Nonetheless, he prayed over the decision and received information from God that because of the hernia, his motor, his system, would break down on the way. Thus, although he did not go to Sinai, in June of that same year, he made a very brief visit to the Pomak villages of Thrace. Footnote Pomak, a frontier tribe of Greek Thrace and eastern Romelia. Their traditions and customs bear testimony to the fact that the Pomak were once Christians, upon whom Islam had been imposed by force. By and large, the Muslim minority who lived there had occupied his mind. Indeed, he had asked a friend to provide him with a map so he could familiarize himself with the region beforehand. On the map, he had noticed that one of the Pomak villages was called Manakoi or Manaki. So he asked his companions to visit it. In Greek, Manakos means monk. Upon arriving there, the people approached them in a friendly manner, and so he got into a conversation with them. Father Paisios asked them why their village had that name, and an elderly Pomak replied, Long ago there had been an epidemic in the village and many had died. One day, seven monks came carrying an icon with them, and immediately the evils of the disease stopped. From that time on, the village was named Manaki. Upon hearing those things, the imam, who is also the teacher and president of the village, scolded the Pomak for what he had said. Then he turned to Father Paisios and, in a hostile manner, told him to leave the village. After they left the Pomak villages, they stopped at the monastery of Panagia Fanaromeni near Komotini, where many people had gathered waiting for Father Paisios. Seeing the crowd, he wanted to leave, but a Pomak he knew, who had been baptized a Christian, pleaded that he stay until a paralyzed Muslim woman had a chance to see him. While they waited, more people were constantly arriving, among whom were some Muslims, who approached Father Paisios with respect. To some Christians who had been taken aback, he said, You must love these people because they are ours. Set an example for them. Your goodness will help them appreciate what Orthodox Christianity is and see that Christ truly abides in Christians. In the meantime, someone had placed a microphone before him so that he could preach to them, but he did not want to do that. At the insistence of all that he speak, he approached the Pomak he knew, took him aside, and said, Tell them that I cannot preach a sermon, but if they want, we can simply say a few words. Then the microphone was turned off, and the saints spoke with them by answering their questions for half an hour. Someone asked him about the Antichrist. Do not be afraid, he replied. Christ, out of love for the faithful, will shorten the years of the Antichrist. The dominion of the Antichrist will last for three and a half years. 
just as God helped back then with, with the miracle of the Kaliva, something similar will also happen with us, and God will protect us. Do not be afraid. Footnote. Wanting to pollute the Christians during the first week of Great Lent, Emperor Julian the Apostate secretly ordered that food that had been polluted by the blood of animals sacrificed to idols be placed in the marketplace. The holy martyr St. Theodore the Tyrant appeared in a dream to Eudoxios, who was then Archbishop of Constantinople, and advised him that koliva, boiled wheat, be offered in place of the defiled food. Signs of the Times During the late 1980s, there was a great deal of debate over the Greek state's attempt to issue a new type of identity card, which included the number 666. And because there were disagreements, even among spiritual people, and confusion had been created, Father Paisios wrote a brief article entitled Signs of the Times, in which he discusses the identity card and its inclusion of the number 666, as well as the seal, which the faithful should not under any circumstances accept. Among other things, he wrote, hidden behind the secular spirit of today's, quote, freedom, unquote, behind the lack of respect for the Church of Christ and for elders, parents, and teachers who have fear of God, there exists a spiritual slavery, an anxiety, and anarchy, all of which lead people to an impasse, to spiritual and physical destruction. Consequently, behind the perfected system of a card of useful services, quote unquote, behind the security computer, hides a global dictatorship, enslavement to the Antichrist. Footnote. At this point, the saint wrote, Revelation of John 13, verses 16 to 18, and he causeth all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Return to the text. The signs are very clear. The beast of Brussels with the 666 has swallowed virtually all the nations up into the computer. The car, the identification, the introduction of the seal, what do they reveal? After the card and the identifying, there will then come the filing, so that they can proceed to the sealing by insidious means. People will hear continual announcements on television. Some person took the card of so-and-so and cleaned out his bank account. And then the very next day, the perfect system, quote-unquote, to avoid such theft will be advertised. The seal with the 666, the name of the Antichrist, will be etched via laser into the hand or the forehead in such a manner that it will not be visibly apparent. In spite of all these things that I have mentioned, one also unfortunately hears a great deal of nonsense spouting from the minds of some of today's quote-unquote knowledgeable people. One says, I will accept the identity card with the 666. I will add a cross to it. Another says, I will accept the seal on the forehead with the 666, and I will add a cross on the forehead. One hears many other similar foolish notions which foment the idea that one is sanctified in such ways. They are, however, delusions. Foreseeing that the article would be utilized in the future, the saint wrote it himself and signed it as well, so that no one could doubt that it was indeed his writing or alter his views, which were not simply views, but the fruit of prayer and divine information. Footnote the God-enlightened opinions of the saint were adopted unanimously by the Holy Synod of the Church of Greece when the subject came up again in 1998. He had even issued an encyclical letter, which was read in all the churches. Return to the text. Indeed, after having prayed a great deal over this particular issue, he received a, quote, telegraph, as he related, about the way God will provide for those who will not be sealed. He did not reveal the manner, but only said, 
Those who will not be sealed will fare better than the others, because Christ will help those who will not be sealed. This is not a minor issue. God has a way. Footnote C, St. Paisios, Mount Athos, Spiritual Councils, Volume 2, Spiritual Awakening, by the Holy Hesychasterion, St. John the Theologian, Soroti Thessaloniki, page 204. Hernia Operation Before leaving the Holy Mountain for the feast day of St. Arsenios in November of 1987, Father Paisios prayed to him, St. Arsenios, what is going to happen with the hernia? What shall I do? He then saw himself as another person who had undergone the surgery, and being thus divinely informed, he decided to have the operation. Although the surgeon was apprehensive beforehand, the saint reassured him. Have no fear, he said. I have seen the surgery. It will go well. And so it did. For within seven days he returned to the Hesychasterion. He began receiving people from the very first days afterward, even though he was not yet able to get up from bed. An elderly woman from Asia Minor, who had come to receive a blessing from him, saw that his face was aglow. The saint also seemed to have seen something, however, because he sat up on the bed, held her hands respectfully, and kissed them many times. Another woman saw him blaze like a white sun, while his entire room was illumined by a white light. It was seven o'clock on a winter evening, and taken aback, the woman said, O Yerunda, the sun has come out. Where do you see the sun, you blessed woman? He asked her, and then he immediately asked how her children were doing, and even mentioned their names, although he did not know the children themselves. The woman then related an accident her son had had. Don't worry, he assured her. He'll receive a quote-unquote pension from God. Not money, but rather a pension from the word in Greek, which means, I unite myself unto. Footnote. According to the service for the mystery of holy baptism, the priest turns the cate- to the catechumen, turns the catechumen to the east and asks, Dost thou unite thyself unto Christ? And the catechumen, or the sponsor, responds, I do. The question and answer are repeated three times. This means that he is now on the side of attached to or united with Christ. Return to the text. St. Paisius continued, Do you know what this word in Greek means of I unite myself unto? Ask your daughter and she will explain its meaning. Her daughter was a philologist, but the woman was again taken aback because she had not mentioned that fact to the elder. When she went outside, it was nighttime, but having abruptly left the brilliant light in the room, she could not make out which direction to go. She left praising God that she had seen a saint with her own eyes. On the evening of November 29th, the eve of the Feast of St. Andrew, the saint was lying down on his bed and praying, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, the beast. Most holy Theotokos, save me, the beast. Suddenly he saw a woman dressed in black come out from the icon stand that was on the opposite wall, pass over his bed and disappear into the other wall. He did not see her face, but judging from the divine exaltation he felt, he realized that at that very moment, Panagia had visited his cell. Second Visit to Sinai As soon as he recovered from the operation, which would have been at the beginning of January 1988, he decided to go to Sinai and stay there for as long as he possibly could. He started out, still feeble, and walking with difficulty. His heart, however, raced toward the desert with unrestrained vigor as the heart panted for the water brooks. Psalm 42, 1 or 41, 2 in the Septuagint. This time he was unable to ascend to the rocky crags and ascetic dwellings. 
He remained in the monastery and visited only the ascetic dwelling of St. George of Arsalom and the monastery of Faran or Paran in the Sinai Peninsula. The archbishop begged him to stay for a few days to help the nuns there. The godly elder advised them, Be loving and humble, cultivate good thoughts, and constantly glorify God. One day, while they were all gathered outside the church, he singled out one of the nuns who had a rather difficult personality and said, Come here, you ornery one. Come, I have something to tell you. And he went on, You are like those trees that twist and turn in the wind. However, in the hands of a good carpenter, the wood from such twisted trees makes for the best furniture, because it is durable and has a beautiful grain. The nun became very thoughtful upon those remarks, while the other nuns understood that they ought not to judge anyone according to external characteristics. During that same time period, the monastery of Faran had also extended hospitality to two young girls who were sisters according to the flesh. One afternoon, as they were talking beneath a date palm, the younger one said, Oh, how I would love to be up on a date palm and chant hymns to God. I myself am still too young. I don't think such things, responded the older sister. When the saint met them in the late afternoon of the same day, he said to the younger one, Well, well, you date palm woman. So you want to sit on top of a date palm? And then pointing at her sister, he said, Let her alone. She is still young. The two sisters were surprised by his remarks, for it had been impossible that anyone had heard their earlier conversation. A few years later, in Athens, the date palm woman met up with a young man, a friend of hers, who was going to the holy mountain to become a monk. She accompanied him to the bus station and advised him, Go to Elder Paisios and do whatever he tells you. The young man went and talked with the saint, who, while he was seeing him off, asked, By the way, can you tell me, how is that date palm woman? The date palm woman? He asked. I don't know any woman by that name. Who are you talking about? I'm referring to the one who went with you to the bus station, he replied. Even on his second visit to Sinai, Father Paisios could not stay there for longer than a month because he became ill and did not want to be a burden to the monastery. Before he left, Archbishop Damianos insisted that he choose a quiet place so that they could have it ready for the next time he would be able to return to Sinai. Then the saintly elder, who did not want to give up the hope of reliving the sweet life of the desert, chose an accessible place called Tarfa, which is located halfway between the monasteries of St. Catherine and Faran. In fact, he related that saints who had led an ascetic life there and been martyred are buried in that place. At the end of January 1988, Father Paisios said farewell to the desert for the last time and returned to the holy mountain. Demonstration Against the Blasphemous Movie in November of 1988, Father Paisios left the Holy Mountain, not only to attend the vigil dedicated to St. Arsenios, but also to take part in a demonstration that was to take place in Thessaloniki against the promotion of a movie that blasphemes the person of Christ, the God-Man. Footnote, this is Martin Scorsese's film, The Last Temptation of Christ, based on the book of the same title by Nikos Katsanzakis. Father Paisios had received divine information about the need for him to take part in that demonstration, which was also the reason that he had persuaded the fathers of the Holy Mountain to participate as well. Boiling with righteous indignation, he took a militant stance against those, those who had, had affirmed that the blasphemous movie was simply a work of art. His attitude towards the movie roused others who had felt that the best opposition was indifference and silence, to join the demonstration as well. 
about that type of opposition, the saint had said, The presence of Christians in the demonstration against this blasphemous movie is most definitely a confession of faith. One might be able to help more through his prayer, but others will exploit his silence and say, So and so did not demonstrate, therefore they agree with us. And thus great harm is done. The demonstration took place on Sunday, November 6th, in front of the church of St. Demetrios, the patron saint and guardian of Thessaloniki. Opposite the church, on the balcony of the meeting place, called Katafiji, stood the speakers, the hierarchs, and the Holy Epistasia, or Executive Committee of the Holy Mountain. A little further in the back stood Father Paisios, even though the superior of the committee tried to pull him forward in order to stand by his side on the balcony. His face revealed youthful strength and spiritual vitality. His fervent prayer, as well as the sacred enthusiasm of which he had been possessed throughout his life, was readily apparent as he listened to the speeches and looked at the gathered crowd. Ultimately, the storm of protest raised by the church together with the fervent participation of the faithful, as well as the prayers of all, brought about a result. The Greek state prohibited the blasphemous movie from being shown. Second Visit to the Pomak Villages In May of 1989, Father Paisios made a second visit, a longer one, to the Pomak Villages of Thrace. He was driven there by a young man with whom he was familiar. Upon arriving, they also took along with them two Pomak men who had become Christians who frequently visited the elder. They first asked for the blessing of the Metropolitan and then began their journey to the villages. The goodness of Father Paisios touched the hearts of the simple people. And because they had heard that his godfather, Father Arsenios, was a saint who had performed many miracles in his native country, Farasa, even for the Muslims there, they all wanted to see him and invite him to their homes. Those who were from other villages invited him to also visit their village. In every home he visited, all the neighbors gathered as well, in some thirty, in others fifty Muslims, just to hear something directly from him. He said things along the lines of, God loves all of us, you are also children of God. A Muslim who becomes a Christian can be saved more readily than one who has been a Christian since infancy. Since the Muslim does not know anything about these things, when he converts to orthodoxy and learns everything from the beginning, he becomes a better Christian. If all of you confess Christ, you will be in a better position than we are. Because although we know all about these things, we unfortunately do not apply them. As he walked on the streets of the villages, the people gathered around him, and he looked upon them with compassion, gave out candy to the small children, and spoke with everyone. One Muslim woman, who had decided to be baptized into Orthodoxy, approached him and asked, I don't know anything. What should I say in my prayer? What is it you know that you can say? He asked her. I know how to say, Lord have mercy, replied the woman. Say that constantly, the saint advised her. They went to the house of a possessed Muslim woman, who upon seeing the elder approached him, and with a contemptuous look said, I have demons. All right, all right, the saint answered and entered the house with her, taking one of the pomaks who had accompanied him with him. Do you want to get well? he asked her. Yes, answered the woman. He then took out his wooden cross, and whispering the Jesus prayer, proceeded to touch her forehead with it. She jumped back abruptly and pushed the elder away with force. The devil is very strong, he said to the Pomac. We have to restrain her. They managed to hold her down, and the saint made the sign of the cross twice on her forehead. Then the woman fell to the floor and started to scream. Go away, I don't want you. Foam came out of her mouth, along with an unbearable stench. The Pomac was frightened, but the saint reassured him. 
It is coming out. Don't be afraid. Tell her to expel him. As soon as she said, Satan, leave, the saint placed the cross on her forehead for a third time. Then they saw a demon that looked like a black dog come out of the woman, leaving her in a dead faint. As soon as she had recovered, she said, I no longer have the heaviness I had felt inside me, but I feel like I am burning. A fire has come out of me, and it has burned me. Afterwards, the woman turned to the Pomac, and in her own language asked, How much money shall I pay the priest? I used to go to the sorcerers and the imam, and they charged me 500,000 drachmas. How much shall I pay this time? I have 150,000. Is it enough? Father Paisios understood what she was saying and said, Tell her to give the monk a blessing that God may accept him in some small corner of paradise. He doesn't want money, the Pomak told the woman. Tell him only to have a good paradise. When they came out into the yard, everyone was astounded to see the woman so transformed. Her face was no longer fierce but gentle. She looked at Father Paisios with gratitude and asked him, What should I do now? What should I do? Read the gospel, he told her. Never look at the coffee cups, nor tell people their fortune. Try to work as much as you can. By working you shall get rid of such things. If you do not occupy yourself with work and begin doing the same things again, you will again become possessed. By looking at the coffee cups, he was referring to fortune telling. To his companions, however, the saint said, If she doesn't put a cross on her, that is, if she does not get baptized, she will not become well. That afternoon they went to another village, to the home of a paralyzed woman who lived there, secluded in a dark room. Many people, however, had gathered there, and they pulled the elder in every direction. I too am ill, shouted one. Make me well too, shouted another. At some point the saint turned to a newly baptized Muslim woman and said, What is going on here, my child? What do these people seek? They want us to work miracles. They do not seek anything for their salvation. Yerunda, she said, The word has it that Elder Paisios has come to Thrace, and he will perform miracles. They are all waiting for you to show them something. What can I show them, the saint said. What can a worm show? What do you think? May God not permit such things. If miracles are to be worked, the devil will exploit them. He will create temptations and he will harm us. And he prepared to leave. Since it was already past midday, one woman began to set a table for them to eat. But the elder said to his companions, What is this? Are we to eat the food of our children? They thanked her and left. When they had exited the village, they stopped and ate something that they had brought with them. While they were there, a Muslim woman approached them, a little girl of about ten years of age, who was very thin and feeble-looking, accompanied her. The child is sick, the woman said to the saint, and the doctors say that she will die. Do you love God? the saint asked the little girl. I love him, replied the girl. The saint asked the same question three times, and the little girl gave the same answer each time. Then he told her, Don't be afraid. You will become well. You will grow up and even have a family. And that is what happened. In the afternoon, they went to the monastery of Panagia Phanaromani, where they were to spend the night. Many people were waiting for them there, both Christians and Muslims, and they all quickly flocked around Father Paisios to receive his blessing. He declared, I am not a priest, but as a monk, I pray that you will have the blessing of Christ and of Panagia. As time passed, more and more Muslims arrived, who had also brought sick people so that he could heal them. They all wanted to touch his cassock and kiss it. Some fell on their knees to kiss his hands and his shoes, while they tried to restrain them from doing such things. 
some prominent political and military personalities had also come to the monastery, and they sat with the elder in the Arkandariki. One of them remarked, Truly, Father Paisios is a man of God, a saint. Another one said, The holy mountain is the lighthouse of orthodoxy. The elder, however, did not seem to attend to their words. He had fixed his gaze upon the window, out of which he watched the Muslims who had gathered, and he did not say anything at all. He only whispered the Jesus prayer at intervals. At some point, a military commander approached him and requested that they speak in private. Yes, we may talk, the elder replied, but you'll have to leave shortly and you will not be able to sit and talk. But Yeronda, I came so that we can talk, repeated the commander. You shall go, my son. You will not stay, the elder said. Shortly afterwards, the commander was informed that a serious accident had occurred and some soldiers had been injured. He turned back, looked at the elder, and said, Yeronda, I am leaving, but we will talk. Together with the commander, a military doctor also got up to leave. He gave Father Paisios an envelope in which his wife had placed some money and a note on which she had written a request for his prayers that their son do well in his university entrance exams. The elder held his hand tightly and whispered, Remove the money from the envelope. What money? asked the doctor. I don't know anything. My wife gave me this envelope. Adam, listen to Eve. Don't say that Eve is to blame. Just take it. Take it out. The saint repeated imperatively. The doctor was embarrassed, but he opened the envelope in front of all of them and removed the money. Leave the other paper, the elder said, and then he saw them off. At nightfall, the Christians gathered in the church and talked with them for some time. A young man said, Father, religion confines us. It restricts us. And a woman added that the children feel oppressed. Then the elder related the following example. Before he is born, the infant is protected within the womb of the mother. He is under confinement. After the child is born, the parents place their baby in a crib with a railing all around it. The crib is like a little prison, but the parents do this out of love for the child's own good. When the child is learning to walk, they hold him by the hand to protect him from falling. And when he grows up, there are the laws of the state which he must observe. In other words, there is a need to have some restrictions. Otherwise, impunity and rebelliousness lead to destruction. In the same way, the commandments of God protect people so that they won't fall. In other words, out of love for us and for our own good, God has given us his commandments to help us correct ourselves. It is not that God has a need for us to do his will. It is we who have the need to do God's will. But that is something for which we must feel the need to do. On the next day, they continued their journey through the area. The saint was pleased with his communication with the Pomac people. Then again, they too loved him. Will you stay here with us forever? They asked. Some Pomacs who knew him proposed, We can build a makeshift Kali for you outside of Komotini, and there you can see and help the Muslim people. If that happens, they will all become baptized Christians. The saint then replied to them, You are also to blame for those Muslims. A Muslim who is in the depths of Turkey and does not hear a church bell is justified. But that poor Muslim who hears both the bell and the imam will have to provide an answer to God. That is why you are also to blame. You must do missionary work and approach these people and talk to them. Ordinarily, all the Pomac should have been baptized. There is no excuse whatsoever for not having seen to this. Before departing from Thrace, he stopped in Xanthi at the officers' club, where the military men of the previous day, who had departed suddenly because of the accident, waited for them for him. They told him about the accident and then talked about the international political conditions 
in the Eastern Bloc nations. Footnote, the Eastern Bloc is the state members of the Warsaw Pact, that is, the allied communist countries. Return to the text. Even Greece, Yerunda, which is an Orthodox Christian country, is not on the right path, said one of the military doctors. The tree may look like it has dried up, but the root below is strong and healthy and will produce many shoots, replied the saint with optimism. They also asked him about the then Prime Minister of Greece, and the elder, even though he was in the officer's club, did not hesitate to say, he could even tutor the devil. Hearing such remarks, the officers were frightened and changed the subject. The saint gave a small cross to each officer as a blessing and left. On the return journey, his companion asked him, Yet under the Pomax have been in Greece for so many years, why don't they become Christians? We are to blame for their not having become Christians, answered the saint, shaking his head sadly. The first Christians needed the whole world. K-N-E-A-D-E-D, -E -E needed. We Christians of today cannot do anything. We are lukewarm. The elder also spoke to him about the joy of sacrifice and about death. We will all die one day, he told him. The essence of it is to have some kind of good death. Which kind of death is a good death, asked the young man. To provide some benefit with your death, to have some good come out of your death, answered the saint. Shortly thereafter, he added, to be martyred, to have compensation from God as well. Visit to Nafpaktos In July of 1989, one month after he had visited Thrace, Father Paisios, whether in the body or whether in the spirit, we do not know in which manner, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, visited the mountainous region of Nafpaktia, where he had been a wireless radio operator of the quote-unquote crazy dual company of 200 men during his military service. The only person present at that visit was at the time the Bishop of Nafpaktos Alexander. He was authenticated, he has authenticated the following facts. At midday one day, the bishop heard the doorbell of the episcopate ring he opened the door and saw an elder he did not recognize. He was about 65 years old, very modest and quite reserved. He invited him in and offered him something to eat, but the elder hesitated. Finally, at the insistence of the bishop, he sat with him at the table. He told him that his name was Paisios and that he had come from Thessaloniki in order to visit the monastery of Panagia Ambalakiotisa. There is no means of transportation to the monastery, said the bishop, and the road makes it rather difficult for us to go at this time. You will spend the night here, and tomorrow I will drive you there with my car. I don't need to sleep, the elder said. I also see that you don't have the room. It doesn't matter, I can just stay here on the chair. The bishop, however, gave him his own bed to sleep on, and early in the morning on the following day, drove him to the monastery. Why are you so interested in this monastery? The bishop asked him. When I was young, he replied, I went through difficult times in this area. I was a soldier in the National Army, and we fought against the guerrillas. The elder entered the church alone and remained there for about two hours. When he came out, he was deeply moved. They ate a little bread with some olives and started on their way back. At some point on the road, just before the village of Anokora, the elder said, Let's take this side road. They did indeed take that side road, and eventually came to an opening which was encircled by fir trees with a chapel in the middle. It was the chapel of the Holy Forerunner at Macrivatos, where forty years earlier the quote-unquote crazy dual company had been stationed for a long time. Let's go in. You come with me too, said the elder. He asked that the icons of the iconostasis be transferred to the episcopate. 
He also asked that the small bell hanging outside the chapel be taken there as well. Then he said, please, let me walk around here a little. He walked around the area for about an hour. As he walked around, he often stopped to scrutinize some spots in particular or to examine some trees endemic to the area. I remember this place, which is why I wanted to walk around it, he explained to the bishop when he returned. They took the icons and the little bell and returned to Nafpaktos. Footnote, the icons and the little bell are still at the holy metropolis of Nafpaktos as of this writing in 2015. The elder wanted to leave, but the bishop offered him hospitality for a second night. The next day, he took him to the station to take the bus for Thessaloniki. While he waited there with the elder for about 20 minutes, the elder said a few things which revealed that he had the gift of insight and foresight. Up until then, the bishop had not heard anything about Father Paisios. Later, of course, he heard that he was a saintly man and well known to many people. That visit was one of those rather different visits, quote unquote, the elder sometimes made. Spiritual Radar While the World is in Turmoil Elder Paisios had often remarked, only once in my life did I read a newspaper to find out when I would be recruited to serve my military tour of duty. If something happens, either it will become known and I too will hear of it, or I will learn of it through prayer. Indeed, the saint had not only learned of some of the more dramatic events that occurred at the end of the 1980s through prayer, but he had even seen them with this quote-unquote spiritual television many years before they occurred. He had prophesied the fall of communism in Russia, as well as in the other communist countries, ten years before it happened. In 1979, he had said, Communism will fall, the Soviet Union will fall apart, and it will become many countries. In Albania, the churches will open, and orthodoxy will gradually triumph. He reiterated those prophecies many times. To a group of people visiting him in 1988, he said, In the Old Testament, due to the sins of the people, God allowed for three generations to remain enslaved in Babylon, and afterwards he provided for their liberation. Each generation counts for about 25 years. Three times 25 equals what? 75 years, they responded. The Russian Revolution took place in 1917, plus 75 years later equals, he asked them. 1992, they responded. And immediately the saint changed the subject. Indeed, by 1992, all of the totalitarian regimes in Eastern Europe had fallen. In May of 1989, during a discussion the saint had had with the military doctor at the officer's club of Xanti, he said, Do you know anything about fishing? Do you know what will happen if someone catches a lot of fish with a net that is rotten while the sea is stormy? The nets will break and the fish will escape, replied the doctor. The Soviet Union, continued the saint, is like a fishing boat that has thrown out its nets and has caught a lot of fish. The nets, however, are rotten and creaking. Any time now they will break. All those nations will be liberated. Do you know that shameful Tsausi? He asked. Do you mean Susescu? Chuchescu? Asked the doctor in astonishment. Footnote, Nikolai Ceausescu, Romanian politician who was the absolute ruler after 1965. His regime was overthrown in December of 1989. Return to the text. Yes, that one. The people will kill him, said the saint, and the whole world will see it. In six months, all those nations will be liberated. And in July of 1989, he told some pilgrims, Christ, as you know, was a carpenter. He has a gigantic screwdriver in his hand. Sometimes he tightens and sometimes he loosens. He will now loosen Russia. 
The events which followed confirmed that the saintly elder had seen future events as present events, and distant events as nearby ones. The events which took place in the Soviet Union in August of 1989 brought about its dissolution. Four months later in December, the revolution that brought down the communist regime in Romania took place. On their way to the Cali of St. Spiridon, where monks from Kirkira dwelt, two monks passed by Panaguda. It was the eve of the Feast of St. Spiridon on the old calendar. A lot of snow had fallen and the path had not yet been trod upon. No one had visited the elder earlier. When he went out to open for them, he was very agitated. His face was very red and he breathed heavily. Are you going to St. Spiridon? he asked them. Tell the fathers there to pray fervently because a massacre is taking place in Romania. They're having a civil war. No one had heard anything about it at the Cali of St. Spiridon. In the days that followed, the events related to the massacre that had taken place that night in Romania became widely known. Ceausescu was executed on December 25th, and everyone watched it on television. In October of 1989, the spiritual radar of Father Paisios had made contact with the calamity caused by the collapse of a bridge in America. While speaking with a visitor in the yard of Panaguda, he suddenly started doing his cross and saying, My Panagia, an earthquake. In anguish, he struck his hands on his knees and exclaimed, There goes the bridge, my God, protect the people. Completely perplexed, the visitor stared at the elder until he had recovered and continued the conversation. Somewhat taken aback, the visitor took his leave, but on the next day, in a newspaper, he read, Great earthquake in San Francisco. A bridge has collapsed. Footnote on October 17, 1989, the Bay Bridge, which connected San Francisco with Oakland, collapsed. More than 60 people were killed, many of whom were buried under tons of concrete. In August of the following year, 1990, a series of military skirmishes took place in the Persian Gulf region. Footnote in August of 1990, Iraq under Saddam Hussein invaded oil-rich Kuwait. A UN coalition force led by the United States forced the Iraqi army out of Kuwait, but not before the Iraqis had set fire to many Kuwaiti oil wells, causing great damage to the environment. As expected, it triggered great apprehension throughout the world. Father Paisios prayed fervently for a peaceful solution, but he was informed by God that war was unavoidable. To some he confided, Keep this to yourselves. While praying, I perceive that war will break out. The evil is not destined to stop. Even the sea will be aflame with the oil from this war. As indeed it happened. The saint followed the developments in the war with his spiritual radar. One day in November, while he was at the Hezekasterion, he said, Today the Americans were going to strike the Iraqi army, but they postponed it. You must pray that the war remains local and does not spread to all the Arabic-speaking countries. At the end of December, he wrote, The conflagration of war is under control for now. We should pray that it stays under control, Otherwise, only the Lord knows where it can go. After he had completed his vigil and was about to lie down at about 2.30 in the morning on January 17, 1991, he sensed something indescribably frightful, and he immediately heard airplanes droning and bombing. He shuddered at that and went out into the yard to pray with the Comiskini. From time to time, scenes of the war flashed before him as he said the prayer with all his strength. In the morning, an acquaintance of his visited him, and the saint asked, Did you learn what happened in Iraq during the night? No, elder, he answered. An aerial bombardment, he told him. Many were killed. You should have seen how the small children cried, and how the mothers beat their breast. There was great lamentation there. How is it that you know about these things? the man asked the elder. I saw everything before me as if on a television. 
During all those days of that military conflict, the saint barely interrupted his prayer. One day some monks went to Panaguda and asked him if the war was going to become worldwide. Go to your cells and pray, he told them rather sternly. Don't you see the innocent children being killed? Soon a great evil will take place. Indeed, a week later, many small children were killed during a new aerial bombardment. On this next visit to the Hezekasterion, the saint also talked to the sisters about the Gulf War. On the one hand, the Europeans and the Americans, he said, have reached the depths of Satanism, all in the name of supposed freedom. On the other hand, Saddam Hussein wanted to be known as Muhammad. God, however, protected the world and the evil did not spread. In any case, the situation is sheer madness. When people are not reconciled with God, can peace prevail? As the Gospel says, for when they are saying peace and safety, then suddenly destruction cometh upon them. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 One of the sisters commented, Yeranda, with this war, the telecommunications are now such that the entire world can see the events at the very moment they occur. It is only themselves that people don't see, replied the saint. They see only all the other people. Nowadays, people destroy themselves with their own minds. It is not at all the case that God is destroying them. The situation requires a great deal of prayer. A divine intervention is needed. Assisting Monks Father Paisius believed that it is imperative that monks dedicate themselves to their mission, which is prayer. Given that belief, he was troubled and saddened to see that the worldly spirit had caused harmful, quote-unquote, interceptions within monasticism, which had rendered the, quote-unquote, wireless transmitters, the monks, useless. Anguished in his very soul, he observed as monks worked on holy days as they occupied themselves with new technologies rather than with their monastic duties, as they desired worldly comforts and luxuries, as they sought out contacts with politicians. Sometimes he was so upset that he became like a fire-breathing lion and with sacred indignation cried out, Secularization is the greatest enemy of the monk, even greater than the devil. He spoke openly to both abbots and plain monks, as well as to politicians. Once a minister of the government visited the elder and said, Yeranda, if you need anything, we are willing to do it for you. Yes, he replied, I want you to build me a road from Carriez here to my Cali. The minister believed him and immediately agreed. Do you know why I want the road built? continued the elder. I'm thinking of getting a small motorcycle and riding back and forth from my Cali to Carriez. And with that, they all laughed. The elder then became quite serious, however, and said, You go about to supposedly help the monasteries, and instead you bring in all of that secular spirit. One who enters a monastery in order to become a monk should divest himself of at least a few things. If he is a little abstemious, he will pray better. If one has all the conveniences, it is not helpful. In August of 1989, the administrative officer of the Holy Mountain, who was a rather young man, visited the elder. He had recently assumed his responsibilities and was thinking of building new administrative offices on the side of the skeet of St. Andrew, which was dilapidated at that time. He had not spoken of his plans of the elder, but as soon as the elder had sat down beside him, the elder said, Look, my son. You have come here on the holy mountain where there is nothing special to do for one who wants to carry out administrative duties. It is like you have a big tractor, for you do have the capabilities, and have been given a small garden to cultivate that is no bigger than the tractor itself. You just barely fit on the space. You can't move one meter forward or one meter backward, nor can you turn. There is nothing you can do. The Holy Mountain, from the point of view of administrative responsibilities, is a small garden, but for us who came here to become monks, it is a giant spiritual field. 
we plow and plow and the work is never finished. Upon hearing those remarks, the administrative officer changed his mind and did not proceed with the transferal of the administrative offices. Father Paisios did not have disciples who stayed with him so that he could be a disciple himself in obedience to all people. Many monks, however, sought his counsel, some regularly and others occasionally. Some monks were sent to him by their own elders so that he could help them overcome some temptation. And many were the monks who, just about ready to abandon monastic life, returned to their monastery transformed, eager to resume their monastic struggle. The saint helped them to think good thoughts about others, to ask many questions about their own selves, and to begin their struggle anew, with confidence in their abbot and faith in God. He pointed out that confidence in one's abbot is similar to the keystone at the summit of a dome, and that if the brick is removed, the dome will collapse. What he especially accentuated, however, is that above all things is God, who scandalously helps all those who selflessly dedicate themselves to him, even when they have to rely on a sailor instead of a captain. Quote, unquote. Once a novice who wanted to leave his monastery because many bad thoughts raced through his mind about the abbot went to the elder. Accompanying him was the senior monk of that monastery, who although he had tried many times to change the novice's mind about the abbot, had been unable to do so. After the young novice had talked with the saint, he was so transformed that the senior monk wondered, what did Elder Paisios do to him? How did he change his mind? They returned to the monastery, and although nothing there had changed in the least, the novice who had been delivered from his bad thoughts not only simply stayed there, but even helped the monastery. The saint did not impose any particular typicon upon some monks who lived in other Kalia and sought advice from him constantly. He recommended that they maintain a spiritual program, and that they move about freely in a philotimo-filled way. Moreover, he advised them to keep their contacts to a minimum and to lead a quiet and simple life without many material goods. Enjoy your monastic life, he told them. Your cell should be as simple and ascetic as a cave, and as clean and devout as a chapel. Technology can offer some help for daily needs. However, where do the needs end? One thing leads to another, and we become unable to stop at any given point. Simplify your needs and cast the daily cares out of your life. He, of course, rejoiced when he saw their ascetic spirit, but he also took care to safeguard them from the danger of considering themselves better than any other monks. One day, two monks who often sought advice from the elder went to Panagura. They had their donkey with them. The elder discerned that they were feeling somewhat proud of the fact that they did not have a car, and so he said, Do not compare yourselves with those who have a car, but rather with those elders of old who lugged their belongings about on their backs, and then you will realize in which type of spiritual condition you find yourselves. Some monks who were his spiritual children had given him the right to correct them, and so the elder sometimes scolded them and even shouted at them. And if he noticed that although they had a good disposition but did not cut, catch their own selves out, he became even more stern. As he himself remarked, he didn't hesitate to put the knife to the bone in order to increase the effectiveness of the surgical procedure. Once he explained his remark, let's suppose that you have one small pimple and one large wound. I see the wound and understand that it will heal. It is nothing. However, I notice that the small pimple will have a bad outcome. But you, what do you do? I scold you and you give in to bad thoughts. What is this about? It's nothing. He found this little thing and he is shouting. Yes, but it is the outcome of that small pimple that I see, which is why I shout at you. He especially underscored the spirit of sacrifice, of spiritual nobility. To some monks who are preparing to move from one Kali to another, 
he counseled. Before you move out, be sure to leave the Kelly clean. Also, do not take all your things. Leave some clean sheets and blankets so that the monk who takes up residence in the Kali will be able to sleep there on the very first night. Leave the glasses, the dishes, and the pot so that he can cook and eat. Do not ask for money for the Kali. Take whatever he may give you. Do not tell him how much he should give. If the amount is small, it doesn't matter. Let the balance be a gift in remembrance of your parents. Once, a monk who was being inundated with many kinds of thoughts decided to wait for the elder, who wasn't there at the time, outside of the fence of Panaguda. Shortly thereafter, the elder returned from the forest. He seemed tired, but his face was bright and rather incorporeal. He said nothing to the monk, not even the usual greeting, bless. He received him into the Kalivi, to the workroom where he made the wooden icons, and picked up a large wood plant planer. As he started to plane the pieces of wood, he said, We must sacrifice ourselves, we must tire ourselves out, we must be patient. We must sacrifice ourselves, we must tire ourselves out, we must be patient. The elder repeated those phrases for about ten minutes. In the end, he said, All right now, it is time for you to go. The monk received his blessing and with his mind unburdened took his leave. At another time some other monk visited the elder. He was almost in tears because certain brothers at the monastery had said something about him that had grieved him. As soon as the elder saw the state he was in, he discreetly sent the other visitors away. All right, Polycaria, you must leave now, for I have some work to do. When the two were alone, before the monk began to speak, the elder said, Well, well, my child, aren't you ashamed? Are you truly a monk? As for me, people call me a sorcerer. What am I to do? Should I be upset because I am called a sorcerer? God gives us an opportunity to earn a heavenly reward, and we kick it away with our grieved feelings. Toughen up a bit. Some monks who had fallen away from the monastic order, due to some human weakness, also visited the elder. The austere ascetic treated them with love, admonished them with patience, and heartened them by rousing their sense of philotimo. Nevertheless, he also alerted them, Be careful, otherwise God will give you such a smack. The elder asked one wretched monk who had been led astray by the passion of drinking to chop some wood for the fire. He handled him with a great deal of love because he had been wronged and had not been helped in his life. At some later time, a journalist happened to interview this particular monk. Are there any saints here on the holy mountain? The journalist asked. Me, I'm not a saint, he answered, but I do know a saint, Elder Paisios. Why is he a saint? Has he done any miracles? asked the journalist. I didn't see any miracles, answered the monk, nor do I know if he keeps the fasts, the vigils, the prayers. But I do know one thing. As you can see, I drink and get drunk, and the fathers do not want me. However, Elder Paisios asked me to chop firewood for him every year, even though there are others, good and virtuous ones, who even have a wood-cutting machine. He asked me, because I do not have any other way in which to earn my keep. I go there and he asks me, How much do you want? Four thousand drachmas, I say. He tells me, I'll give you six thousand because you are poor and a good man. Then even though others let me work alone, he comes to help me, and every now and then he says, Father, you are tired. Sit down for a bit and get some rest. On those days, he even takes care to have sufficient food and wine so that I can eat my fill. In addition, when some visitor comes, he praises me and says, Go and receive the blessing of the elder. I believe that this man does these things because he's a saint. In due time, that monk received help. He eventually recovered from his passion and went to live a consistent monastic life. Father Paisios did not approve of any lay people criticizing monks. 
Once a young man told him that he had seen a monk sitting at a coffee shop in Caries. Listen, my son, the elder told him. That man left his family, his work, his property, and came here to the holy mountain to struggle for his salvation. He still has one bad habit, and he is still trying to break it. If you want, let's make an agreement. You give up all the things that he has given up. You come and become a monk, and I'll let you go to Caries once a week. The young man hung his head in shame and admitted, Yet I cannot do that. The great Delconia of Father Paisios was to correct the bad thoughts of both monks and lay people. It is as if I were to abandon the front line. Even though the saint had always had a burning desire to go to a faraway, unfamiliar place and to once again experience just one Sinai-like day, as time went by, he realized that it was virtually impossible. In 1988, he said, Now that all the people determine my program, it is difficult to hide myself somewhere. I feel as if my hands were tied. I should have attempted this earlier. I should have gone to the Holy Land without cassocks, with only a sackcloth for a garment and a cap. I could have been enrolled on the Monacologion, or monastic roster of God, and that I would have celebrated the monastic life. Unknown amongst the unknown, I would have lived with God and no one would have recognized me. From time to time, different people he knew, some from Australia and some from America, suggested that they prepare an hezekasterion for him so that he could go there and have greater hezekiah. No matter which of the fathers he asked, each one dissuaded him from doing such a thing. In fact, one of them remarked, You, Elder Paisios, have a canon to receive the people and to comfort them. Shortly before 1990, the saint was also divinely informed that he was to remain in Panaguda to comfort the people. Therefore, obedient to the will of God, he put an end to his treks into the forest and limited the hours he remained in retreat in his Kali. If he did not manage to read the Psalter, he prayed only with the Kambaskini for the specific circumstances dictated by the Psalms. When some monks asked him about the change they had observed in his program, he responded with the verse in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Isaiah 40 verse 1. He let it be understood that that verse was the commandment he had received from God. In May of 1989, he said, When the war is over, it is then that a soldier is released from duty. We now have a war going on, a spiritual war. If you only knew how much I am being pressured from every side. Within, however, I feel soulless. If I leave, I will look up upon it as if I were to give up my weapons in a time of war. It is as if I were to abandon the front line, as if I were to retreat. I consider leaving to be a betrayal. Lessons in the Yard of Panaguda Having given himself entirely to God, God in turn gave Elder Paisios to the people of his time as a gift. He was a mighty comforter, a fervent preacher of repentance, a staunch veteran fighter for the faith and for our country. He faced every person with a Christ-like simplicity and became all things to all men, that he, he might by all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9.22 During the approximately 15 years that he lived at Panaguda, he received thousands of people of every age, educated and uneducated, poor and wealthy, high school students and university students, politicians and military men, believers and non-believers, the curious and the indifferent, heterodox and non-Christians, those who were deluded and those who were possessed. To some he uttered two words, with another he spoke for a few minutes. To several people he spoke for hours. For many, meeting the saint became the reason to change their way of life. And there were a great many who, although they had descended the path to Panaguda with great difficulty due to the weight of their many problems, later departed virtually soaring. 
Yet who can ever describe what each person experienced while they were near the saint? One person said, Even though I am 55 years old, I feel like I have lived for only half an hour. That was the amount of time I had sat beside him, seeing and being seen by a living saint, Father Paisios. Another person said that the day he had been next to Father Paisios was the most spiritually brilliant, sunshiny day of his entire life. Another said that the way he in which the saint had treated him was like having received an injection which had healed his wounds. Another person spoke about the fact that the elder's love made no exceptions. Yet another spoke about how the elder had inclined himself to his problem as he attempted to help him find a solution and had suffered and cried with him as if he himself were experiencing it. The words of the saint were very simple yet profoundly meaningful. Once someone asked for his advice about a problem and the saint replied, Patience and prayer. Nothing else, elder? he asked. What more can I say to you? Patience and prayer, the elder reiterated. Is that too little? But we came here for you to speak to us, to give us a sermon, the man continued. I am old now, he replied, smiling. If I were young, I would have climbed onto the tile roof and given you a sermon. He usually never began speaking with his visitors right away. More often than not, while everyone was waiting to hear something from him, as they sat in the open Arkandariki, he sat silently with his head bowed, waiting for just the right opportunity, just the right question. But if a question was posed out of an insincere interest, then the true man of God did not answer, or instead began to speak about unrelated things. That was also, however, how he revealed their real interest to them. Thus, if he was asked, Yerunda, how can we make spiritual progress? He in turn asked, what is the value of the English gold lear now, or lyre? Or, what is the cost of a Mercedes these days? He was troubled when people just said, tell us something spiritual. For behind such a request, he saw that there was no good restlessness, no deeper spiritual pursuit. When you go to the grocery store, do you tell the grocer, give me some groceries? Or if you go to the pharmacy, do you tell the pharmacist, we want you to give us some medicine? What groceries or what medicine are they to give you? For one to help himself, he must have a real interest in doing so. One must be able to say to himself, I lack this, I lack that. I need to learn this in order to be helped in my struggle. Occasionally he himself found a reason to start a discussion. Once a large seashell, which had come from a fan muscle that some young man had given him, served as a starting point of a discussion. On its inside, the muscle is beautiful. It's smooth and has lovely colors, while its outer surface is rough. Father Paisios picked up the seashell, looked it over carefully, and addressing everyone, he said, Here the saints are like this seashell, rough and bumpy on the outside, because they have no, give no heed to the externals. Nevertheless, they were smooth on the inside, and had lovely colors because they did refined inner work on themselves. Nowadays we are completely the opposite. We are lovely on the outside, but inside we are rough like the outer shell of the muscle. At another time, someone asked his blessing in order to record the conversation on a small tape recorder, which then became the starting point of a discussion. The saint did not give his blessing, and later said, Look, my sons, you must simplify your lives. Within a year, a new tape recorder will be made, and its cassette will come out like a drawer. After that, there will be another new one, with some other button or gadget to more easily remove the batteries. There will be no essential difference between the three tape recorders, but people want to buy the latest model. 
This is why you ought to live simply and not get caught up in the mesh of endless worldly advancements. Sometimes the starting point of his discussion was the place of the visitor's origin or their profession. Where are you from? he asked some visitors. From Crete, they replied. There in Crete you have Tsikudya, he remarked and then continued. Footnote. Tsikudya is the Cretan word for Tsiporo or Reiki. It is a clear alcoholic beverage which is made from the distillation of pomas, grape skins, seeds, and stems that are pressed during the winemaking process. He continued, If we pour some tsikudya in a glass and leave it there for several days, it goes flat, isn't that right? The alcohol evaporates, and what remains can neither kill germs nor light a flame, nor can it be used as plain water, and so we throw it out. The same may be said of the spiritual person who is not watchful. He loses his sharpness, his spirit, and is rendered useless. And where do you work, he asked. We work at the telecommunications network, they responded. If the wires become rusty, they do not make for good contact, isn't that right? We need to remove the rust to clean up the wires. The same thing may be said of a person. If he becomes rusty from sins, he needs to be cleaned, to repent and to confess, in order to make contact with God. When a group of American executives visited him, he asked, In America, what brings you joy? The increase in our profits, they answered. I rejoice when I help some soul, he replied. That's when my profits increase. Oftentimes, before the discussion even began, or just as it was coming to a most pivotal or vital point, something would happen to distract the visitor's attention. The elder had perceived that such occurrences were occasionally a trick of the evil one, so that people were deprived of any benefit. Thus, he was in a state of constant vigilance. Once, as soon as the visitors had sat down upon the logs, many large horse flies appeared and began flying around their heads. Do you understand what this is? asked the elder. It is an attack by the enemy, whose name we will not even mention. He did this to hinder us from talking, to deprive us of receiving any benefit. We won't do him the favor. Wait. He went and cut some small branches from an arbutus shrub. He cleared the leaves from each branch and left only three on the top. He gave one branch to each of the visitors and said, Take one of these branches and with it strike your head once, your shoulder once, and your left shoulder once, thus making the sign of the cross. As soon as the visitors did that, the horse flies disappeared. One day while the elder was talking with people beneath the olive tree, they heard a sound coming out of its foliage, which had been caused by a blackbird. The noise was so disturbing that the visitors wondered, Is it possible for a bird to make so much noise? Then the elder lifted his gaze upward and said, Haven't I told you that when we are talking here, you are not to disturb us? The noise stopped at once, but as soon as the elder began talking, it started again. What did I just tell you? Please, go away from here, the elder said. The noise stopped briefly, however it again started up. The end result is that you refuse to compromise, the elder said. I'll just have to sweeten you up. He sent someone to bring the box of lucumia, put one in the palm of his hand, lifted his gaze upward, and said, Come, take the lucumi, and go away. The blackbird immediately came out of the foliage of the olive tree and landed on the shoulder of the saint, Come, he said again, take the lukumi. I will not bend my arm. The little bird walked the length of his arm, stopped at the edge of his palm, and began to peck at the sweet treat. No, you will not stay here, said the saint. You will take the whole thing and go away. The bird speared the lukumi with its beak and flew far off. The visitors marveled as they watched the paradisical scene in the yard of Panaguda. 
Father Paisios took care that his communication with the birds and the animals not become the object of curiosity. He was troubled when he heard some of the various rumors that circulated about him. Once he was visited by a man who had brought two boys with him. As soon as they entered the yard, the man said, I have heard about some lizards and snakes that you have here, so I brought the children with me. Is it possible for us to see them? The elder smiled and replied, The circus has closed. At another time, some visitors said, we have heard a lot about you. Can you do a miracle for us? The elder immediately fetched an axe and said, Spread out, spread out. Why, Yaranda, they asked. I'm going to cut your heads off, he replied, and then I'm going to glue them back on. Spread, sp spread out or they will get mixed up. <laughs> they will get mixed up and I won't be able to put them in the right place. The people were frightened and left quickly. The saint was grieved whenever people asked him to do miracles in order for them to believe in God. He used to remark, Faith that lacks philotomo seeks miracles. One must believe in God in a philotomo-filled manner. He ought not to want miracles in order to believe. When I see that adults ask me to do some miracle so that they can believe in God, do you know how I feel? If they were young, they might have an excuse because of their age. But these adults who have done nothing for the sake of Christ, and yet say, let's see your miracle so that we can believe? It's something that cheapens everything. Even if they were to see a miracle, would it really help them? They will say it is sorcery, and so on. Once, however, an amazing thing happened. A professor of a university insisted, Yeranda, I am an educated man. I cannot believe that God exists. My blessed man, the saint finally countered, even if we ask a lizard, it will tell us that God exists. You are more foolish than a lizard. Do you want me to prove it? Looking to his right and to his left, he saw a lizard and called to it. Come here. The lizard went to him and St. Paisios asked it, Tell us, does God exist? The lizard then lifted its body and nodded its little head up and down in agreement. The professor lost his composure and began to cry. Then the elder remarked, Do you see that you are more foolish than a lizard? A lizard knows that God exists, and you with your wonderful brain have not understood this? On another day, a conversation about faith took place in the open Arkandariki of Panaguda, and someone said, Father, I do not believe in God or in miracles. What are those things anyway? Stop, the elder countered. Put your head here on the log. I will cut it and glue it back on for you. The man bowed his head and placed it on the log. The elder fetched the axe and lifted it ready to strike. Everyone who was there laughed. My blessed fellow, you are more faithful than I am, the elder remarked. You believe that I can do a miracle, and that's why you bowed your head. Get up. Shortly afterwards, he explained further, If God wanted to force all people to believe, it would not be a difficult thing for him to do. But by doing so, he will have bound and negated the free will of the human being and made everyone feel constrained to believe in him due to his excessive power. The elder did not usually talk about dogmatic issues and was very careful when people asked him about something doctrinal. His answers were the fruit of prayer, and he usually cited simple examples. Since some people had asked him about the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, he wanted to find and transplant a cypress tree that had three tops. He searched throughout the forest, but did not find one. One day, however, he saw a tiny cypress tree growing near his fence. It had a trunk that had branched out into three separate tops. He surrounded it with stones and tended to it. Thereafter, whenever someone asked, How does it happen that there is one God in three persons? He sent him to look at the little cypress tree. Go over there, he said, and tell me how many cypress trees comprise those three tops. There are one tree, they replied. Do we now understand each other? the saint asked. 
One other time, someone asked him, Yerunda, what will happen with those people who do not know about Orthodox Christianity, even though they may be good people? At the monastery at Sinai, the saint replied, There are the fathers of the monastery, and there are the Bedouins. The abbot works with both. If he has to leave the monastery for any reason, to whom will he give the keys of the monastery? To the fathers, he replied. It is so with God, continued the elder. All people are his children, but he gives his grace only to the Orthodox. At another time, when the main topic of conversation was Orthodoxy, the elder said, Let me ask you something. Who do you consider to be the greatest enemy of Orthodoxy? One said the Pope, another said the Masons, and still another said the Jehovah Witnesses. At the end, the saint said, Have you ever thought that we ourselves may be that enemy? For if we were true and perfect Orthodox Christians, there wouldn't be even one single person today who is not an Orthodox Christian. Elder Paisios, who had spent his entire life working out his repentance, found himself working to guide people to repentance as well as to confession. Oftentimes, as soon as a group of visitors had sat in the open Arkandariki, he asked them one by one if they had a spiritual father. One time, everyone answered yes, and only one had said no. Where are you from, my son? the elder asked. From Patisia, he answered. That's an area in central Athens, split into neighborhoods upper and lower Patisia. You must find a spiritual father, he told him, so that you can walk straight. Footnote, the saint had used a pun about the name of his neighborhood. At another time, a young man declared, Father Paisios, I lead a spiritual life. I attend church and receive Holy Communion. The saint listened to him silently with his head bowed. Then he looked at him and asked, Do you have a spiritual father? Do you go to confession? I don't have a spiritual father, answered the young man, but when I want to receive Holy Communion, I confess before the icons. The saint then countered, My good son, can you see your face without a mirror? Is it possible to disclose your sins without having confessed to a spiritual father? Can you receive forgiveness of sins without the priest having placed his stole over you and without his having read the prayer of forgiveness? He sent some visitors to confession first so that the fog will dissipate and the horizon will become clear as he told them and they would then be able to converse and understand each other. Some people responded, Yerunda, since you understand what it is that I should do, just tell me. Even if I understand what you must do, the saint answered, you will not understand what I will say to you. That is why you must first go to confession and then come back and we'll talk. Once as another young man was leaving Panaguda, the elder cupped his palms and called out, Thomas, hey Thomas. With confession, man is not only saved, he is also sanctified. The conversation in the open Arkandariki often turned to the upbringing of children. Someone asked, Yerunda, how can we properly raise our children? Parents must help their children understand that they cannot live far from Christ, replied the saint. Christ is the only way. John 14, 6. There is no other. If parents can transmit this to their children, there is no need for anything else. That is what raising children is all about. Another person said, Yerunda, we don't know how to behave toward our children. So the elder advised him, When you drive on the road and come to a traffic light that is red, you stop. If it is green, you go. This is how you should behave toward your children. There is no need to press too much or to be too slack. As for the counteractions of adolescent children, he gave the following advice. In this case, there are two things you are required to have the patience of a donkey, and boundless love. The visitors often spoke of their worry about the loose morals of the youth 
and about the general spirit of acceptance that all things are equal. The elder himself was worried and uneasy about the matter. Dark powers, he declared, are trying to destroy everything, and they will start firstly with the education system. In the old times, the school was next to the church, and the teacher preferred that the children attend the divine liturgy and lose an hour of school, and the children themselves were like lambs. Now they have become like kid goats. They strike their parents. They strike those who govern. They turn everything upside down. They hold demonstrations. They occupy their schools. They cut glass. And at the end, when they get to the point of disemboweling those who govern, then they will become sensible. He did say, however, that God will judge the children with some leniency because they are not to be blamed since they are dictated to by others. We must pray, he advised, because many children will be maimed. The good God, however, will judge them accordingly. He will consider the inner state they might have reached had this wretched regime not harmed them by having made sin fashionable. He spoke with justifiable anger about the rulers of the country for having legislated laws contrary to the law of God and thereby pushing the youth into immorality. Righteously indignant, he read the 94th Psalm to them. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? Psalm 94 or 93, verses 1 to 3, 1 and 3. He also read the 83rd Psalm. Keep thou not silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Psalm 82, verse 2 to 4, and verse 7, the Septuagint. At the same time, the saint pleaded with God to reveal true people, new Maccabees, and placed all his hope in him. To many people who are worried about the future of Greece, he confidently said, Do not worry, Greece is not destined to be lost, because it is the bulwark of orthodoxy. If the nation were in the hands of the politicians alone, it would have been lost already. Fortunately, Greece is in the hands of God, who scandalously protects it. Each time the nation is in danger of being lost, he does something at the last minute and saves it. And soon there will be a hullabaloo because the devil is organizing himself. But do not be troubled. In the end, Christ himself will sow and reap the fruits. The good God does not allow a bad thing to happen if it will not result in something better afterwards. We will go through an almighty shake-up, but it will result in the glory of Greece and the brilliant gleam of orthodoxy. The elder, of course, did not mean the ascent of Greece in a worldly sense, but in the spiritual sense. Greeks should live in all piety and sobriety, so that they may be entitled to the help of God, who raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Psalm 112, verse 7 to 8, the Septuagint. Above all, he believed that national issues ought to be spiritually confronted so that the nation will have God as an ally. On the issue of Cyprus, he said, Cyprus needs spiritual bases, not the military ones that the great powers of the world want to build. The spiritual bases of faith and repentance will save Cyprus. And to a young man who was worried because he was about to undertake his compulsory military conscription, he said, If we Greeks had faith and knelt down to pray, and altogether beseech Christ and Panagia to protect us, then we would see miracles, and we would truly no longer have need for an army. Now, however, we have need of an army, my son. Moreover, in order to rouse the Greeks to live as worthy descendants of their heroic ancestors and as genuine children of Orthodox Christianity, in order to reassure them 
that by having Christ on their side, they have nothing to fear. He also related some prophecies which have to do with the enemies and the so-called friends who have always threatened Greece. About them especially, he said, Our enemies want to tear us apart. Even our friends want to humiliate us. But it doesn't matter. People have their plans, and God has his plans as well. In 1992, some professors told the saint that in the future, the then 12 member states of the EEC, European Economic Community, will constitute a new state with a powerful government, a unified foreign policy, and a good economy. After carefully listening to them, he said, even if 12 different carpets are sewn together, they cannot become one. Within one century, the great powers of Europe have slaughtered their people in two world wars, and they continue to have so much egoism that they have not yet asked forgiveness. Is it possible for them to become one common state with common interests? The EEC will be disbanded because of the egoism of the great powers. On another occasion, after a minister of the European Parliament had visited with the elder, a Hiram monk whom Father Paisios knew also visited his Kali. The saint opened a box of many colored chocolates to treat him and said, Here, this is what the EEC is, little chocolates of all colors, but like all chocolate it melts with just a bit of heat. The saint also often referred to the prophecy that Constantinople will again be a part of Greece. To many it sounded incredible, and some people visited him just to hear him say it himself. One day, when all the visitors in the open Arkandariki were sitting quietly, the saint said, I know what you want to ask, if Constantinople will be ours. God will bring things about in such a way that the interests of the powerful states will be served by their turning Constantinople over to us. There are spiritual laws, and they will go into effect. Someone then asked, Yeranda, even if it is given to us, what can we do with it? The saint answered disapprovingly, My, 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 with you, my son, I will not even go to Ierisos. Many people asked, Yeranda, given the many sins we Greeks have, how is it possible for God to return Constantinople to us? Our sins are indeed a hindrance that delay the course of events, the saint remarked. However, the Turks have also committed great injustices and barbaric acts against the Greeks, which is why the spiritual laws will go into effect. The saint did not say such things as mere conclusions drawn from his experience of spiritual laws. He had also been informed by God, as he himself had confided to some people. To a few other people who had persisted in asking him if and when Constantinople will be returned, the saint responded, Does Christ abide within you? That is what you should be concerned about, so stop thinking about when Constantinople will become ours. Father Paisios often talked with the military officers who visited him about Constantinople, as well as about other national issues. He loved them in particular, especially those in whom he saw faith, selflessness, and ideals. He rejoiced when he heard them say that they are ready to fight and to sacrifice themselves with joy if the need arose. Referring to them, he said, These philotomo-filled souls are like the sweetest treats to me. They take away all my bitterness, all my pain. Nevertheless, there were also people who either on their own or by sending others who worked against Greece and Orthodoxy, visited Panaguda in order to spy on the elder or to create confusion and the ongoing discussions and occasionally even to threaten him or harm him. One day, when many people were seated on the logs, a heavy-set man came and sat at the edge of the group. At that time, Father Paisios, who was conversing with the others who had gathered, had just said, Come on, you are only good for parades, not for battles. Christ sacrificed himself. We have the Orthodox Christian faith. We have saints who are martyred and who still help us. If they had not fallen and been martyred, 
Who knows what we would have become? And now Palikaria is needed. If some do not fall, nothing will be accomplished. The heavyset man did not speak, he only observed. The elder felt his presence as some cold thing. When everyone else had left and the two were alone, the man rushed upon the elder, grabbed him by the neck, and said angrily, You and your gods! The elder felt that the man had insulted God. What gods, you godless man? He shouted indignantly. I worship only one triune god. Go on now, get out of here. And he gave him such a shove. The heavyset man fell down in a heap and curled up into a ball. He then got up and left in fear. At another time, a sturdily built young man visited the elder and threatened him. Old man, I don't want to ever see you again in Thrace. Don't you ever get involved there again or else. What are you saying, you scoundrel, replied the elder. You a German citizen, a robust, a robust Palikari, with studies and an education. You went to Mecca, and they made you a Muslim, and now you're working for the Turks in Crete, pretending to be a shepherd and spying on the military bases there. Get away from here. The saint had not even finished speaking, and the young man had already gone. The elder remarked, I rejoice when many threaten to do away with me, because I speak out and spoil their machinations. What Marxists, Zionists, Masons, Satanists they all are. Since I do nothing else, if God deems me worthy of martyrdom, it will be good for me, won't it? And late at night, whenever someone happened to jump over the wire fence, his heart pounded with the longing for sweet martyrdom. He was also visited by heretics who wanted to entrap him, but the discerning elder readily recognized them and treated them accordingly. Once two Catholics visited him. One was a journalist and the other a secretary of the Vatican. They asked him to recite the Our Father with them. In order for us to to say the Our Father together, he replied, we must also agree on the doctrine which we don't, since between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. Luke 16.26 Well then, one of them said, will only the Orthodox be saved? God is with all people. Yes, God is with all people, replied the saint, but can you tell me how many people are with God? We should show love, they then said. Even sin has become fashionable, said the saint. It too is within love, they answered. Today everyone talks about love, peace, and harmony, he finally told them. But all of them are divided with their own self, as well as with other people, which is why ever more bigger bombs are being made. Whenever the saint observed that the heterodox who visited him had a good disposition, and they sought the truth, he treated them with singular love and understanding. He didn't press them to become orthodox, but imparted the good restlessness within them. He therefore opened his abundant treasury and revealed some of the spiritual treasures that living the orthodox faith and leading an orthodox life had granted him in order for them to perceive that they are deluded and to spur their interest in orthodoxy. Thus the good God provided for a considerable number of heterodox through the help of Father Paisios, to be led to the true faith and to be baptized as Orthodox Christians. Sometimes through the fiery tongue of the grace of the Holy Spirit, the saint communicated with heterodox who did not know Greek. One night he had accommodated a French professor who left his Kalevi the next day in order to return to Kutlumusiu Monastery. There he told the fathers that he had spoken with Father Paisios, who had answered all his questions. The fathers were confounded by that, but the French professor insisted that Father Paisios had spoken French. Later, one of the monks went to the elder and asked, Yeranda, do you know French? Of course I do, he answered. Say one word for me, the monk said. In a rather enigmatic ma manner, the God-illumined elder uttered the ancient Greek phrase, which means, is there illumination or is there not? 
The saint used that phrase, which sounds like the English phrase, thank you, in order to reference the illuminating light of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, Father Paisios and the French professor had experienced Pentecost. The saint had spoken in Greek and the professor in French, but through the grace of the Holy Spirit, each one had heard his own language. Yet another time, a Spaniard, a student of fine arts, was seated among the visitors in the open Arcandariki. After speaking to the others, the elder then turned with concern and affection toward him. First he uttered a few words in Italian, which he had known since the time of the occupation, and then he continued to speak to him in Greek and gave him a great deal of advice, which contained of many truths. A visitor spoke up and said, Yeranda, since he does not know Greek, what can he possibly understand? Whatever there is for him to understand will reach him through the wireless, answered the saint, and of course, he meant divine illumination. Interactions with Children In one of his letters, Father Paisios wrote, Even if one is mute and cannot speak any language, when he has love, Christ himself, he can communicate with all of the billions of people, and even with every age group of people, for they too have their own language. Thus he himself was able to understand and communicate with people of all ages. Small children spoke in a very natural way with him. They did not feel that they were talking with an older person, and the elder himself felt like a child with them because he saw them as little angels. One morning, while he was conversing with someone in the yard, his face lit up and said, A little angel is coming. In a little while, the voice of a small child was heard, and the elder said again, Do you hear that? The angel is coming. And a group of people that included a small child arrived. On one occasion, a Greek immigrant from Germany went to Panaguda with his ten-year-old son. As soon as the boy saw the elder, he said, I want to become a monk. I too would like to see a monk with the name of, said the elder, using the boy's name. That's me, shouted the boy with joy. But I have some prerequisites, said the elder. You have to complete university and learn two foreign languages. The boy thought a little and said, I have not finished university, but I know two languages, Greek and German. The Greek language does not count, the elder said. Then the small boy asked the elder, Do you know any foreign language? There is only one language that I am interested in, replied the elder, the fiery language. What language is that? asked the boy. The language of Pentecost. A parent asked the saint, Yerunda, what can be done in order for our small children to understand us parents? The elder looked him over and said, have you ever entered into the mind of your child to become a child? How, therefore, do you want your children to understand you? The saint entered into the mind of children, and with his saintly manner was also able to handle their childish reactions. Once a priest and his nephew, who had an ivory tooth hanging from his neck, visited Panaguda. The priest had often advised the boy to remove the ivory tooth and to put on his cross again, but the child had refused. While they were all seated out in the yard, Father Paisios began to turn about in his seat and look around as if he wanted something. What do you want, Yaranda? they asked him. For a long time now I have been searching for something, and now that I have found it, he answered. What is it, Yaranda? What is it that you want? they asked him again. There, that tooth he replied, pointing to the adornment around the boy's neck. I'll give it to you, the boy said, and proceeded to remove it. No, how can I take it, my boy? It belongs to you, continued the elder. I will give it to you, insisted the boy, and he took it off and gave it to him. Do you know why I want it? the elder asked, smiling. Some wild boars pass by here, and one of them is missing a tooth. That's why I want it. The boy laughed, and when he returned home, he put his cross around his neck. On another occasion, two children who spent many hours watching television 
went together with their father to Panaguda. Their mother had often scolded them, and at one point they had heard her say, O oh, Father Paisios, now that they are going to the holy mountain, tell them something about that television and the evil that it is doing. At that time the children had laughed at her and said, As if, there is no way that Father Paisios can hear you on the holy mountain. But when they sat down with other visitors at the open Arkandariki, the elder looked at all of them and then opened the discussion and said, Well, my children, you have no idea of the evil that television does. He spoke about the radiation that it emits, as well as about the harmful shows that defile the souls of people. Shortly afterwards, he also related, I will also tell you about electronic computers. A professor I know told me that computers emit radiation that is harmful to both the eyes and the brains of children. The two boys, who had recently acquired computers and also spent many hours in front of them, left Panaguda greatly benefited because they felt that Elder Paisios had spoken exclusively for their sake. During bright week of 1988, 40 high school students went to Panaguda with their teacher. Outside the fence, there were about 50 people who had been waiting since early morning. As soon as all the children had gathered near the gate, the elder opened it and said, The children may come in. Full of joy, he received them and said, Pick up a log, make a circle, and sit down. To the teacher, he said, Come with me. Let's go and get some treats for these boys. They brought a large box of leukumia and a basket with dyed red eggs. All of these must be eaten, will not take anything back. Then he went to fetch water, and the students ran after him. Some of the boys took pictures with their cameras, and the elder did not react at all, which was unusual for him. He teased them, played with them, splashed a little water on them with the hose, while they laughed aloud. Yet they looked at him, deeply impressed with his figure. Afterwards, he sat with them for about two hours and talked about how they interact with their parents and their teachers. The students told him that they often felt pressured, and the elder explained that parents restrict children, but not without reason. The point is to help them mature properly, like the small trees that are supported to grow straight and bear fruit. They got into a conversation, and virtually all the boys spoke openly because they felt comfortable since the elder spoke to them with such love and simplicity. At the end, he said, I will come with you to Cariez. And going ahead of them on their way out, he said to the people who were still waiting, Today Panagia has sent me the students. I cannot see anyone else. Please forgive me, I am going with them. He went with them all the way to Cariez, bid each and every one of them farewell as they got on the bus and then returned to his keli in order to provide some solace to those who had waited for him to return. With the Students of the Athenite Academy The students of the Athenite Academy were among the most frequent visitors of Father Paisios. Footnote, the Athenite Academy was established in 1748 on Mount Athos as an Academy of Greek Studies. Today it functions as an Orthodox high school under the jurisdiction of the church. The students live in the dormitory within the school. Over the weekends, when they did not have classes, small groups of students descended onto the path to Panaguda. Welcome to the royal princes of Panagia, the elder greeted them. He knew all the students by name. He gave them, quote-unquote, formal blessings. That is, he reserved the best of the things people had brought him for those young students. He stood by them for whatever needs they might have had and advised them in a simple way. He often spoke to them about St. Cosmas Etolos, who had studied at the Athnite Academy. He's commemorated August 24th. You have a saint for a schoolmate, he told them. Read his teachings and follow his example. He also told them stories about Athenite fathers of the past and underscored the great blessing they had in studying in the Paravoli of the Panagia. 
he urged them to respect their professors and to behave with devoutness and sacred awe. You cannot achieve anything without a blessing, he advised them. He also jokingly said, Be careful, if you are caught misbehaving, I will quote-unquote throw stones at you from down here. There are many times that the saint quote-unquote tuned into their conversations from a distance. Once at noon, as some of the students descended the path towards Panayuda, one of them asked, If I ask Father Paisios for wool to make a combeskini, will he give me some? If he has some, he will give it to you, his classmates responded. They arrived at the Kali and had a conversation with the elder, but the student didn't ask for the wool. When they got up to leave, and that student approached the elder to receive his blessing, the saint briefly paused and said, Wait, let me get the wool you wanted. At another time, when the elder had gone inside to bring some treats, one student said to his classmates, If I ask Father Paisios to receive me as a monk at his Kali, do you think that he will accept me? Before his classmates could answer him, the elder brought the treats, and the conversation stopped. But when the students got up to leave, the elder stopped that student and said, Where are you going? Aren't you going to stay with me? The saint lovingly forestalled the youthful enthusiasm of some students who had asked to become his disciples and set down the following rules. In order for me to accept you as disciples, you must first complete your studies at the Athenite Academy, attend a university, and learn two foreign languages, but you yourselves are not to speak up or out. The saint helped many students find the path they would follow in their lives. One student from Crete, who had just completed the second year of high school at the academy and had returned to his hometown, had announced to his parents that he was going to some monastery to become a monk. To them the decision seemed immature, but in the end, because they could not convince him otherwise, his worried mother said, Go, my son, what more can I say to you? Do whatever Panagia enlightens you to do. Returning to the Holy Mountain, that student went to Father Paisios and said, My parents have permitted me to become a monk. If you will also give me your blessing, I will go to a monastery and become a novice in repentance. The elder who foresaw the future of the student said, Go back to Crete and stay there for one night. And if you return here, then you can become a monk. May it be blessed, said the student, and he returned to Crete. Upon his return, he was introduced to a young woman to whom he was soon engaged. In September, when he returned to the Holy Mountain to continue his studies at the Athenite Academy, he went to Father Paisios, who laughingly received him and said, It seems that you are rather late in returning. And as it turned out, he was the first to refer to the engagement, about which no one had known anything. The elder then told him the name of the girl and a few things about her life, and he then also advised, The girl is sensitive because she is an orphan. You must look after her and not afflict her. Helping the Youth Many young men also visited Father Paisios. Some of them had psychological problems, Others were addicted to drugs and alcohol. Some were students who had fallen behind in their studies. Others considered themselves anarchists. Still others had long hair and wore earrings. The elder had said, In order for one young person to become cultivated and bring forth fruit, let me become the potting soil. And he indeed sacrificed himself all the more for those young men. Once a visitor arrived as he was conversing with a group of young men who spoke rather impudently. Annoyed, the visitor approached and said, Yerunda, how do you endure them? Send them away. The elder paid no heed to him. In a little while, he again approached and repeated himself. The elder gave him an anguished look and asked, How is it that God endures you? Have you ever thought about that? The saint believed that the young men who visited him had been unfairly treated, either by their parents or by the prevailing worldly spirit. 
which was why he believed that the youth is entitled to divine assistance. Having turned himself around and begun attending church services, one young man who had experienced living miracles asked, Yerinda, why did all those miraculous things happen to me? The saint replied, It is because you are not only not helped when you were young, but instead you were actually pushed toward evil. That is why you are entitled to divine help, and the good God gave it to you all at once. Moreover, he said, It is enough for the youth to taste the grace of God just once. After that, even if you try to pull them out of the church with a crane, they will not budge. The saint could see directly into the hearts of the young men and treated each one accordingly. He approached some of them in a good manner and spoke to them as one speaks to a young child. He told jokes to others in order to amuse them. He gave haircuts to still others. Come, my boy, let me cut your hair, he told them, because you look like an Evzoni sol soldier at the tomb of the unknown soldier at Syntagma or Constitution Square with the red slippers. I'm a good barber, don't worry. Footnote, this reference was to an infantryman of a special corps of the Greek army. He took them behind the chapel and cut their long hair very carefully. He had even given a good smack to a few. He did everything with the love of Christ, which is why no one reacted negatively. Once a young man who had a huge ego and looked at others with contempt visited Panaguda. How are you, Padikari? The elder said to him and smacked him right across the face. What's going on with you, my boy? He asked and smacked him yet again. Come on now, my child. Bravo, bravo, he said and gave him another three smacks. Hey, Yaranda, take it easy, said the young man. Let your head ring a little and perhaps it will wake up, said the elder, who afterwards treated the young man with a great deal of affection. A young man who had given up his studies and was working in his father's electrician business had decided to visit the Holy Mountain with some of his friends. Before leaving, he had visited his sick grandmother, who, seeing him with his long hair, asked him, Will you cut your hair only after I die? I don't know, grandmother. We'll see, he had answered and left. A few days later, he and his friends were standing outside the fence of Panaguda. Father Paisios came out and, leaning his arms on the wire gate without having opened it, asked them their names and about the work they did. The young man did not say that he worked as an electrician, but that he was a student of physics at the University of Athens. Do you still have many courses to take? Yes, many. Do you want to pass them all? Yes, I do. Come then, he said, as he took a pair of scissors out of his pocket. Let me cut your hair. The young man laughed and bent his head. Father Paisio smiled as he looked at him and said, Come, I'll even give you a combuskini as a gift. And he took a combuskini out from his other, other pocket. The young man nodded his head in agreement, and then the saint unlocked the gate and invited them all in. He took the young man behind the chapel, and as he cut his hair, said, Love the work you are doing even though the young man had said that he was a student. By loving the work you do, the saint explained, you will not be mentally tired, only physically tired. And he reassured the young man again and again that everything will go well with him. When his friends saw him with his hair cut, they laughed, and one of them gave him a friendly slap on the back of his neck. Smiling at that, the saint said, let me give him a slap as well. And as the young man bent his head, the elder took hold of it with his blessed hands and kissed his forehead three times. When the young man returned home, everyone was happy to see him so transformed. He began attending courses again at university and completed his degree with ease. Sometimes the elder looked at the ears of some young men to see if they had had them pierced for earrings. 
don't you hurt when those holes are made? he asked. No, they replied. He then took up the thick awl with which he braided Combusquina in one hand and took hold of their ear with the other hand and said, I will also make a hole for you. They drew themselves back and the saint then commented, If the gospel had commanded that we pierce our ears, you would raise up a thousand fears and objections. Now that the latest fashion promotes it, you're ready to make ten holes. He removed the earrings many young men had in their ears or even in their nose. Come on, Palikari, let's get rid of those things so the devil doesn't use them to pull you around. There was even one time when he had removed the heavy gold chains a young man wore around his neck. My son, he said kindly, those things are not necessary for you. Sell them and purchase food for some poor person. On you, they can only cause harm. Whenever he saw young men with lighters and packs of cigarettes, he confiscated them and threw them far away. One young man declared, Yerunda, you are polluting the forest by throwing them away. The elder who frequently removed the trash from the area responded, Do you care more for the soulless forest or for your own immortal soul and your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and which you ruin by smoking? Reference to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17 and 6, verse 19. Once four young men who due to their addiction to drugs were in very bad condition went to Panaguda. My sons, why do you do this? he asked, anguished. Why are you destroying yourselves? Yet unto we wanted to get ourselves a fix so that we could talk to you. Let me bring a mirror so that you can see what kind of fixing you have done to yourselves, he said joking. The young man laughed at that and drew comfort from the saints, having shined some sun on them. Together they talked about their problems and left with the intention of changing their lives completely. He bestowed joy and optimism to those young men who were drug dependent and thus helped them to recognize the value of spiritual life. Those who take drugs will stop using them, he remarked, when they discover the more powerful drug. And of course, he meant Christ. He advised them to eat carrots, which many of them did, and found that they did not suffer from the privation of the drugs. It was, of course, also his prayers, they later admitted. Those prayers were certainly hiding behind the carrots. The elder also advised young men to work as much as they could, so that their labor could serve to break them away from their sinful activities and start up their quote-unquote rusty motor. In some cases, he even attempted to find work for unemployed young men. In general, he wanted to cultivate their philotimo, their leventia, and their fear of God. We Greeks, he counseled, have a fear of God, an awe, while Europeans have an outer politeness, which is full of egoism. If we lose our fear of God and also have no other politeness, outer politeness, then we will have nothing. Father Paisios, although a man of advanced years, yet full of youthful vigor, advised the young, Be Leventis, struggle and do not be afraid of anything. One who has the fear of God is entitled to divine help. He strongly accentuated the word entitled because he spoke out of experience. He gave them examples from his own life of the sacrifices he had made as a soldier. I was not concerned about anything, he said, neither frostbite nor illnesses. I was always the first to volunteer. Some who were lazy and fearful hid, but they are not proud of that. I experienced the joy of sacrifice. Many of the young men who sensed the love and concern of the elder said that they will become monks. He, however, sometimes sternly and sometimes jokingly, tried to help them realize that monasticism is not a life of leisure. Your demeanor is languid, he remarked. How can you possibly become a hard-working monk? Nevertheless, some of those young men did in the end become monks 
and indeed became industrious. Regarding the youth, the saint deeply pained had once commented, The youth of today do not know what they want. They want to have everything, but expect others to prepare everything for them. They are completely spineless. Although they couldn't be bothered to serve in the army, they assert that they want to become monks, the green berets of the church. Yet they cannot bear any pressure. If they encounter a little pressure or some difficulty in their diakonia, they surrender the guns, quote-unquote. Like little children, they are always saying, I cannot, and upon encountering the least amount of difficulty, they ask for a different diakonia. They then become disappointed and comment, Monastic life is difficult. They want to feel joy. However, for joy to come, one must make sacrifices. Real joy springs from philotimo. It is why a philotimo-filled person will make progress no matter which life he chooses, monastic life or family life. Help for Mothers When the saint was not on the holy mountain, women also had an opportunity to meet with him, either at the Hesychasterion of the evangelist John the Theologian, or at the Hesychasterion of St. John the Forerunner, which the elder also frequently visited. Footnote, the Holy Hesychasterion of St. John the Forerunner is located in Metamorphosis Chakiriki. Once he spoke to all the women who had gathered at the Hesychasterion of St. John the Theologian. They asked him about the upbringing of children, and he, among other things, said, I see children and understand the inner state of their mothers. In the past, a child was sanctified in the womb of the mother through the prayers of the good mother. Today, most mothers do not pray at all. They occupy themselves with foolish things. I have no time. I am tired, they say. If they do not even say one trisagion, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Mortal, have mercy on us, how do they expect their children to be sanctified? He also counseled, Do not imagine that you will be able to raise good children by force. Do not force the children to go to church. They have to learn to love the church, to feel that it is a necessity. Do not force them to be quiet and well-behaved. Help them sense that it is necessary to be well-behaved. The saint advised the mothers not to make many pointed remarks to their children, especially their older ones. Don't say don't too much because they get used to hearing it and then pay no heed. Whatever complaint you have, tell it to Panaya. You do not have a blessing to repeat the same things to the children. With that advice, he tried to urge them to pray with faith and trust in God in order to attain peace within themselves. Worrying over the children, he counseled, is like an umbrella that hinders the grace of God from coming upon them. He received mothers of handicapped children or children with mental problems with a singular love. To the mother of a child with Down syndrome, he said, When little George goes up to heaven, Christ will tell him, Choose the mansion you want to stay in. And he will say, Beloved Jesus, I want my dear mother with me. Therefore, Christ will place all of you together in paradise. Grieving mothers, whose children had fallen asleep in the Lord, also visited the elder. One such mother asked him, Why, Father, did God take my child? Why? You have a garden at home, don't you? The elder asked her. She nodded her head in agreement. When you cut roses to place in your vase, do you only cut large opened roses? He asked. Don't you also cut a few buds? Well, if you choose whatever you like for your vase of flowers, can't God choose the ones he likes for his? Another grieving mother said, Yerunda, I get very upset when I see the clothes of my child who has died. If you only knew what a bright outfit your child is now wearing, he replied, he would not be distressed at all. What he was wearing while living here on earth are mere rags in comparison with what he is now wearing in paradise. 
The saint also helped many childless women to have children by also asking St. Arsenius for assistance. In Farasa, St. Arsenius used to bless a ribbon which the childless women then wore and later became mothers. Elder Paisios blessed small ribbons over the skull of St. Arsenios and then gave them as a blessing to childless women who with his prayers later conceived. The Gift of Insight Father Paisios also helped many people with the rare gift of insight which God had bestowed upon him. With just one astute word, he was able to help a soul, to strengthen the faith of another, and to lead one to repentance. His insightful word was like a sudden bolt of lightning with which God enlightens one. One very snowy day, a forty-year-old man went to Panaguda with a double-barreled shotgun in his hands. Are you Paisios? he asked the elder. I am, he replied. What's going to be the story here? he demanded. I've been going around to all the monasteries to sell a few tree fungi, and no one is buying. Footnote, the fungus of trees is processed to be used as kindling and as wicks for vigil lamps. Return to the text. You at least will buy some, the man said. The elder took out a 500 drachma note and said, Give me 500 drachmas worth of tree fungi. What type of treat are you going to offer me, the man then asked. Well, I can offer you lukumi and water. Don't you have any cognac? Let me see, he answered. Perhaps there are some among the things that people bring for me. And he fetched a small bottle of cognac. After he had drunk it, he said to the elder, Now, are you really a monk? If you were, you would be a katunakia at Kurulia. That's where the real monks go. I've been through there too, Palikari, responded the saint. Well then, why did you come here? For ease and comfort? Before I tell you why I came here, the saint said, I want you to tell me why you went to work in Germany. As soon as the man heard that, his demeanor changed immediately. He lost the airs he had and respectfully replied, Yerunda, I went to Germany because they pay better there. I could earn higher wages. Me too, the saint said. I came here for the same reason. The boss pays me better here, next to Carriez. I earn higher wages. When that man departed from Panaguda, he was a changed man, as if he had been transformed. Once two young men went to Panaguda just after they had been released from prison. In prison they had come to believe in Christ and had also heard about Father Paisios. The saint asked them if they had read the New Testament and then gave them each a copy. Even though he did not know them, he wrote each one's name on the first page of, the, of each book. Ioannis, he asked. Yes, said the one. Gregorios, he then asked the other. Yes, said the other. And below each name he added, with the love of Christ, Monk Paisios. At yet another time, while he was talking with visitors, he suddenly cut off the discourse and approached a young man who stood a little further off. He spoke with him for a few minutes, and the young man left. Returning to the group, the saint informed them that the young man had become involved with a heretical group. The visitor, visitors then asked, Yerunda, how did you realize that he was a heretic in order to approach him? I noticed that he lacked the seal of the Holy Spirit, said the saint. After one is baptized, a seal is received when he is anointed with holy myrrh. However, if one renounces the Orthodox faith, he loses the seal. I told him that he does not need to be baptized again, but that he should seek confession at the first monastery he visits, and then be anointed again with holy myrrh. At another time, an arrogant-looking middle-aged man visited the elder and said, Pray for me, because I have been suffering from terrible headaches from an entire year now, for an entire year now and the doctors have not found out why. The saint who had seen him from afar had realized that he was possessed by the devil. You are possessed, he responded, because you have given the devil rights over you. I haven't done anything, he said. 
You haven't done anything? The elder asked him incredulously. Did you not deceive a young woman? She has put a spell on you. You must now beg her forgiveness and afterwards go to confession, and then the priest must read the prayers for exorcism over you. If you are to regain your health, if you don't repent for what you have done, the demon will not be cast out, even if all the spiritual fathers in the world pray for you. A family man who had many children sought the advice of Father Paisios. Should he use his money to buy a house or to support a philanthropic institution? As soon as the saint saw him, he called him over, caressed his head, and said, Tell me, Constantine, do the birds have a nest? Yes, Yaranda. Have we come to an understanding? Absolutely, Yaranda, said the man, and he left, not only at peace, but very moved as well. At another time, the saint called out to someone, Come, Lampaki. The man was startled because his mother was the only one who had called him by that name. Later the saint offered him a treat, sat next to him and caressed his head. The man, however, out of sensitivity, felt embarrassed and very contritely said, Yerna, do not touch me. I am sordid. I am a scoundrel. Agreed, the saint replied. But do you remember, my dear Lampaki, when so-and-so was killed in an accident, and you took it upon yourself to help the family, and saw to the education of their children? Do you remember when so-and-so had a heart attack, and you hired a private airplane to transport him to a hospital abroad? Do you remember when you went up to the, the, up the mountain to the church of St. Paraskevi, where you saw sheep in the chapel, and then sent the shepherds away by giving them money to take their flocks elsewhere? Do you remember how you renovated that chapel? Do you remember? Do you consider these things to be insignificant? Those are not important things, the humble, he humbly responded. We have our criteria, and God has his, the elder replied. I have committed many sins, Yananda, he insisted. Yes, but if you weigh the good works, they are more valuable, because the intention also counts, the saint explained. He made coffee for him, had his picture taken with him, and later lovingly saw him to the door. The man left, determined to correct all the things that burdened his conscience. A monk was trying to convince a young man to go to confession, and because he could not convince him, finally said, Elder Paisios is nearby. Do you want to go and see what he has to tell us? It was summer, and they found him working in his garden. What are you up to, Yeranda? They asked him. What else can I do? I am confessing my garden. Come now, Yeranda. Does a garden also require confession? Asked the young man. It most certainly does, he replied. I have ascertained that when I confess it and throw out the stones, the weeds, the thorns, etc., then it produces proper vegetables. Otherwise the tomatoes turn out yellowish and sickly. While speaking in the open Arkantariki, the saint often used a problem which also preoccupied one of the visitors as an example and then provided its solution as well. Once while talking with a group of visitors from Crete, he took his walking stick, drew some lines on the ground, and said, Let's suppose that you have here a field, and every now and then the neighbor takes a little bit more of the property. Let it go. Don't take him to court over it. He will regret his actions on his own. One of the people in the group faced this precise situation, and he thus received the answer. When he returned to Crete, his neighbor called him and said, Let's restore the borders between our properties. And he then returned the piece of land upon which he had trespassed. On another occasion, there was a secondary school physics teacher among the visitors. He had made the final exams for the second year high school students very difficult, which had resulted in most of the students having received grades of 8 and 9, with 10 being the grade required to pass. The teacher found himself in a difficult situation, and f had finally decided that those who had received a 9 will receive a 10, and therefore pass, and that those who had received an 8 will fail, and therefore be re-examined in September. Nonetheless, his conscience was troubled, 
and he wanted to ask Father Paisios about it. At some point, while he was seated with the other visitors, he heard the elder say, I will now tell you something about discretion. Let's use an example. Let's suppose that a teacher's students took an exam and received only eights and nines, which are grades below the passing mark of ten. I ask you, what should he do? The others found it difficult to answer, and the teacher himself listened in silence. Let me tell you where the discretion comes in, continued the saint. If he passes them all, it may show love on his part, but he will make shirkers out of those who try less, something which will not benefit them. Discretion says those who got a nine and came close to the passing mark of ten ought to receive a ten. He can give the other students the summer to study and do better in September. Discretion is a difficult thing and requires divine illumination. That is why you should ask God to grant it to you. One day, while a group sat in the open Arcandariki, Father Paisios asked, How is the world doing out there? It's doing well, they answered. The world is not doing so well, the saint rebutted. I have a few tomato plants, but I shall uproot them because they take time away from prayer. Well, for those who do not believe, there is no reason to talk, but even the Christians have become corrupted. One changes the markers of certain fabrics so that he can sell them at a higher price, or an employee asks him for time off because his wife has given birth to their child, and he does not grant it. He does not even give him a small increase in salary. One man in the group went very red in the face upon hearing those, those things. When Father Paisios got up to bring some treats, the man jumped up and shouted, He is a saint. I am the man he was talking about. I am the one who does such things. At another time, a group of students from the theological school visited Panaguda. They sat in the open Arkandariki, and the elder started to talk to them. Shortly afterwards, two more students who had procrastinated arrived. The saint interrupted what he was saying and stated, Well, I never. Eating fried fish on Friday? Wouldn't it have been better to have taken the frying pan and thrown it out the window? Those words puzzled everyone. The two students who had arrived late received the blessing of the saint, and he continued his talk. Later, when the entire group had departed from Panaguda, the two students turned to the priest who had accompanied the group and said, Father, you embarrassed us. Was it necessary to have told the elder? To tell him what, he asked. That we ate fish in Oran Oranupolis the day before, on Friday. The priest had not even been aware of it, yet the students also could not figure out how else it had been possible for Father Paisios to have known it. There were only a few occasions when the saint had spoken revealingly to a person in front of other people. One day when there was a discussion about the Muslim religion, a young man said, But what are you saying, Father? The God of the Christians and the God of the Muslims is one and the same. The saint immediately stood up, approached the young man, grabbed him by the collar and said, Young man, you like Muhammad because he suits you, since he permits you to have as many women as you want. The young man lowered his gaze and became silent. The saint also became harsh with those who were themselves deluded, as well as with sorcerers and heretics who led people into delusion. A sorcerer once took a group of people he was deceiving to the holy mountain. He left his group at the little bridge just before Panaguda, while he supposedly went ahead to speak with Father Paisios. He used to say that he had quote-unquote spiritual contact with the elder. As soon as the saint saw him, he not only sent him away, but also followed him to the little bridge, where he gave him a thorough scolding in front of his group, so that they could also see that they had been misled. Indeed, later, as a follow-up, Father Paisios arranged to send a hieromonk whom he knew well, to the town where that sorcerer lived in order to inform the townspeople of the demonic delusion he was under. At another time, 
While the elder was talking to people, a yoga instructor came to him to receive his blessing. The saint's entire demeanor suddenly changed. He became very austere looking and threw the man a reproachful glare. As if he had been struck by an electrical current, the man was spontaneously thrown back a few meters. He then sat a bit further away, blushed scarlet, and listened to the elder, who had changed who had changed his theme and started talking about Hinduism and yoga. He related that people involved in such practices give the devil rights over them, that they become susceptible to demonic influence and are destroyed. He actually said, Through the practice of yoga, the noose does not remain suspended in midair, but acts as if the devil has placed it on a trampoline and afterwards hurls it away. After talking to them for about 15 minutes, they all got up, received his blessing, and left. That man also left without daring to approach the saint again. Certain lay people, in trying to rationally explain the gift of insight that God had bestowed upon Father Paisios, sought to find the means by which the elder was informed about the particular circumstances of the people who came to visit him. However, even their very thoughts were sometimes, quote-unquote, caught by the man of God. A young man who had a degree in electronic engineering and had heard about Father Paisios suspected that the saint had positioned antennas, microphones, and transmitters on the roof of his calivi, on the fence, and in the surrounding area in order to record the conversations of the visitors and thereafter present himself as having the gift of insight. Therefore, he decided to visit Father Paisios and try, if possible, to search the area. While he waited outside the fence, in the back of a group of about twenty people, the saint came out, lifted his arm, pointed at him, and shouted, Hey you, Palikari, come here, up front, please. Are you referring to me? he asked. Yes, to you. The saint opened the gate and took him directly behind the Kalevi. Sit down, Stylianos, he said. Hearing his own name, which he had not uttered, was the first blow the young man's rationalism received. The saint sat next to him, pointed to the roof, and asked, Do you see anything unusual on my roof? No, said the young man, as he looked at the roof. I have an antenna hidden up there, the saint said. And before the young man could recover himself, the saint continued, do you see anything unusual in the bushes? No, answered the young man again. I have a small machine that records what people say, and then I duped them into believing that I do miracles. You, why have you come? What do you want of me now? The young man started to weep. Don't be grieved, Stylianos. The saint then comforted him. The times we live in are treacherous, and it is good for you to doubt. In your case, your doubt will lead you to faith. That is the road you will take. As a penance now, go and offer lukumi and water to the others, and come some other time so we can talk. Once a lawyer met two pilgrims on the pathway to Panaguda and declared, Many things are being said about that Paisios. I am going now to tell him that I am a doctor when I am really a lawyer. I am going to trick him to see what he'll do. As soon as the saint opened the gate, he turned directly to the lawyer and sternly admonished, Lawyer, keep your lies for the courthouse. Another person who had constantly criticized monks in the monastic life all the way up the path to Panaguda was treated harshly by the elder. As soon as the saint saw him, he waved him away with his hand and said, Go away, just go away from here. To his friend, however, he gave his blessing. Some monks asked the elder why he had not given his blessing to the other man. What blessing could I have given him, he replied. He doesn't even produce one good thought. Even if I were to have given him a blessing, he will say the same things. I sent him away in the hope that he might be shaken up and become prudent. The elder often said, Some call me a saint and others call me a sorcerer. I am neither a saint nor a sorcerer. I am only a sinner. 
surrounded by multitudes of people, the saint was in a state of profound repentance. The more he was honored, the more deeply he was humbled. I am disgusted by praises. They make me spiritually nauseous, he remarked. He even became harsh with people who related miraculous things about him. He was especially grieved over rumors spread about words he had supposedly said. It was not because he was personally offended, but because those supposed words then threw people into confusion. I say things one way, and they transmit them another way, he remarked. This grieves me a great deal. Someone came here, and although I only gave him a glass of water, he then went to Carriez and said, Elder Paisio said that a war is going to break out. After that, can one even dare to say anything at all? In addition, the attempt of some people to tape record his words made him sad. One day he sat with a large group in the open Arcandariki, but no one spoke. The saint was bent over the ground, stirring the dead leaves that had fallen from the trees. At one point, someone started to talk. Elder, with your deeds and your activities, you have become well known, not only here but also abroad throughout the world. The saint raised his head and said, Leave the action and counteraction aside for now. As he looked again downward, he continued, And most importantly, leave the thing you just turned on to tape record me alone. It will not record. The man turned off the recorder he had in his pocket, and all those present marveled. One day someone managed to secretly tape record him. When the saint realized it, he grabbed the tape recorder, made the sign of the cross thrice over it, and returned it to him. The man opened it to take the cassette out, and what did he see? The tape was wound on both ends, but the middle part of it had been scorched. How did you do that? the man asked quizzically. The saint clapped him on his back and said, I didn't do that, the saints did. Why do you mourn? Is it for this life that we are here? With the gift of insight that God had granted him, Father Paisios consoled many people who had experienced profound grief. Once he singled out from a group of visitors from Crete, a man who wore a black shirt. Are you from... Svakya, he asked him. Footnote, Svakya is a mountainous area in the southwestern part of Crete, which is administrated by Khania. Older men from Svakya still wear the everyday black shirts that now comprise Crete's traditional men's costumes. The black symbolizes mourning. No, Holy Father, he answered. I lost my son in a traffic accident. And who told you that you lost Yanis? countered the saint. Yanis is very well. Then he advised him. You are young. You have a family. You are obligated to take care of them. You should not mourn John at all. Those words strengthened the grief-stricken father and in fact changed his life. The saint always tried to help grief-stricken people comprehend the deeper meaning of life, which is for us to prepare for our true homeland, our heavenly one. He always asked them, Why do you mourn? Is it for this life that we are here? The point is not for us to be well here, but for us to go close to God. If one remains unaware of that point, he will either rejoice in a worldly way, or grieve again in a worldly way, and throughout his life he will suffer in vain. He spoke to the ailing and to their relatives about the spiritual benefits of an illness. To one ailing man, he said, My good man, you will enter paradise through your illness. Have you done good deeds in your life? The man thought a little and said, I don't think so. Well then, that explains it, the saint declared. Because you have been slothful, God has allowed you the illness in order to enter paradise. How else will you enter? Don't you see that all the saints have a disability? One has a severed head, another has severed ears and still another has no eyes. What affliction will you present up there? Don't you want to enter paradise? I do, Yerunda, replied the ailing man with yearning, and he joyfully departed. To another man who had besought his prayers in order to not completely lose his vision, 
The saint said, Do you realize what it is that you are asking? If you really knew, you would not ask for it. The real issue is that you see the light up there. And he pointed toward heaven. At another time, he met a young quadriplegic man. As soon as he saw him, the saint said, My, my, what do I see? Wreaths here, wreaths there. I see you wearing many wreaths. He then kissed his paralyzed legs and said, Little legs, little legs, these legs will take you to paradise. The young man was concerned about whether he should go to America for surgery, but the saint said, Don't go to America, because there this kind of treatment is still experimental. Then he also asked him, Shall we pray that you get well? If it is for the good of my soul, then pray for me, replied the paralytic. But if it is not, then it doesn't matter, I'll remain as I am. That's what it's all about, said the saint. The cross you bear will save you. You will be sanctified by the cross you are now bearing. And so that you realize that nothing is difficult for God, take my hand. The paralytic grasped the saint's hand and took up and walked four steps. Do you see that you can walk? asked the saint. But God wants you to be confined to a wheelchair so that you can help other people as well. That young man patiently bore his cross and spiritually helped many other suffering people. Healing of the Soul and Body The saint usually asked those who had asked him to pray for their health whether they had seen a doctor and what he had said to them. He then advised them to do whatever is humanly possible and to leave the rest up to God. He tried to help them acquire a healthy soul through repentance, confession, and a sacramental life in the church. He urged them to pray for their own health or for the healing of their relatives and to make a philotomo filled sacrifice so that God will help them. He advised many to stop working on Sundays and other holy days or to give up smoking so that their ailing children will become well. Once a father pleaded with the elder to pray for his ailing child. I'll pray, said Father Paisios, but you have to do something too. What should I do, he asked. Think of your shortcomings and decide to do away with one of those shortcomings. I smoke, he said. If I give up smoking, will it suffice? It will suffice, suffice, replied the saint. The man quit smoking and his child recovered. Not long afterwards, he started smoking again and his child became ill again. Thus the man returned to Panagura to ask for help. But as soon as the saint saw him, he shouted out from a distance, Why did you come? You know the recipe. The labors and hardships Father Paisios had undertaken to the point of shedding blood, that God grant health of body and soul to certain ailing people, remain unknown. And while he fervently prayed for God to provide a miracle, at the same time he also prayed that the divine help would be perceptible so that those who had been healed will glorify God with gratitude. Otherwise, he prayed, don't help them, O God, so that their debt to you might not increase. He was grieved whenever a person who had been ill did not let him know that his health had been restored. It is not that I need them to tell me thank you, he noted, but that I should give thanks to God and then pray for some other ailing person. Thanks to the prayers of the saint, many ailing people regained their health. Once a father entreated him to pray for a six-year-old boy who had yet to speak, but uttered only inarticulate cries. The saint said, I'll pray, but you must also pray, and God will hear us. For all the days the father remained on the holy mountain, he prayed a great deal. In addition, his wife urged their four children to pray. We will kneel in prayer, and may Panagia hear us. Your father went to Elder Paisios to help us so that Andreas can speak. When the father returned home, Andreas ran first to greet him and asked, Daddy, what did Panagia do for me? Those were the very first words that child pronounced, and from then on he spoke normally. A family man went to Panaguda with his ten-year-old child, who had suffered with bronchiectasis since he was an eight-month-old baby. They found many people waiting outside the fence. As soon as the saint opened the gate, 
the anguished father abandoned the child and ran amongst the others to be the first to speak to the elder. He was four or five steps away from reaching him when he heard the elder ask, What is the matter with the boy? The father explained his severe condition and the elder asked, What do the doctors say? The doctors say, We'll do this therapy and then we'll do that therapy. Never, nevertheless, I say whatever God says, replied the father with faith. The saint then turned toward the people and called out the boy's name. Alexander, come here. And to the father he said, Wait here. He took Alexander into the chapel, and after fifteen minutes they came out together. He returned the child to his father and said, All the best. I'll pray from here, and you need not worry. The boy will be fine. He will become a palikari. He will have a family, and he will be your pride and joy. There is only one thing you have to do. You must take him to church to receive Holy Communion regularly. Holy Communion is the best medicine. The father promised to do that, and full of joy, he left. Two days later, they went to the hospital where the child underwent an examination of his interior bronchi. Previously, the doctors had encountered difficulties in conducting the bronchoscopy. In fact, the last time the child's life had been endangered due to heart failure. This time, however, the examination was conducted with ease and showed that the child's lungs were completely clear as if they had never had a problem. Footnote, this incident, which exceeded the presuppositions of science, was recorded as a rare circumstance and discussed at two pan-European medical conferences. Once a group went to Panaguda together with Christos, a 14-year-old boy. They told Father Paisios, We also have Christos with us. He embraced the boy affectionately, turned to the group, and said, I want you all to know that orphan children received double the help from God. They were all taken aback because no one had told the elder that Christos was an orphan. For the entire duration of their visit, the elder concerned himself only with Christos, who had asked for his prayers because he had sinusitis and was due to undergo a sinus puncture and irrigation within ten days. The saint remained silent but constantly caressed his head and made the sign of the cross over him. Upon leaving, Christos felt much better and on the next day he was completely well. Even though he no longer had the symptoms of sinusitis, he went for the scheduled sinus puncture and then the doctors, having taken a new x-ray, determined that the inflammation of the paranasal sinuses had disappeared. Two friends had intended to visit Elder Paisios, but one of them had suddenly developed extreme pain along the back of his neck. The exams he had undergone indicated contusions on one of his vertebra, and the other, and the doctor had recommended surgery. His wife, however, recommended that he go to the holy mountain. Go, she said. You may become well just by Father Paisios making the sign of the cross over you. Having greatly exerted themselves, they arrived at Panaguda, and as soon as they had sat on the logs, the elder went and sat beside him. I am the husband of Karklia, who sends letters to you, said the ailing man. My wife insisted that I come. I know your wife, the saint said. What's the matter with you? Are you not well? No, Yaranda. I have severe pain along the back of my neck and cannot endure it. I am suffering. The saint then caressed him on the back of his neck and at the same time made the sign of the cross over it. Then he said, Be patient. It will not heal immediately, but it will heal. That night the man was still in pain. In the morning, however, when he woke up, he said to his friend, I have no pain at all. Is it my imagination? However, from that moment on, his neck never hurt again. One Palm Sunday, a university student who frequently visited Father Paisios waited at the gate of the fence without knocking. At some point, the elder hurriedly came out and said, Paniotis, tell me what you want. Yerunda, he replied, you know what I want. 
He had been troubled by eczema for three years, but was too embarrassed to show it to a dermatologist and had not mentioned it to anyone, including, of course, the elder. In response, the saint cut a branch from a Daphne shrub and was outside the fence and struck him on the head with it. The Daphne was wet because it had been drizzling and the raindrops fell on the face of the young man. Go now, the saint said, because a heavy storm will soon break. He took his own overcoat off and gave it to him. By the time the student had returned to Thessaloniki, the eczema had disappeared. In 1985, a 36-year-old woman from Thassos, who was a cancer patient, visited Father Paisios at the Hesychasterion of St. John the Theologian. He was in an extremely poor state of health, and the doctors had given her only a short time to live. The elder blessed her with his cross, prayed for a short time, and straightway told her, Don't be afraid, you have much work to do yet. And of course, there is also St. Pantalemon. Along with his blessing, he also gave her a wooden cross and said, Always keep this cross with you and don't be afraid. When the woman returned to Thassos, she went up to the monastery of St. Pantalemon, whom she had revered since her childhood and prayed to him most fervently. She felt an inner certitude that since Father Paisios had spoken to her as he had, that she would not die. And that is what happened. Within a month, her strength began to return and she felt much better. Her relatives insisted that she undergo further examinations in England, where she had previously had surgery. She, however, had placed all her hope in God and in Father Paisios. When she visited him again, she asked him, Yeranda, should I go to England? I know, he said, that your relatives are worried. If you want to go, go, but don't be afraid of anything. Seeing a certain hesitancy within her, he added, Don't be afraid, you will not die. You will conquer death. At that instant, the woman saw the face of the saint shine as if the light of a powerful spotlight had beamed upon him. From then on, she never even thought of going to England, nor did she undergo any further tests. And whenever Father Paisios was not on the holy mountain, she visited just to receive his blessing. She felt that she visited the best doctor and asked him discreetly about her health. Yeranda, how do I seem to you? He always answered, Don't be afraid, you are well. Don't be afraid, there's nothing wrong. Indeed, this was verified by a Greek doctor from England who had visited Thassos and met with her. Greatly surprised, the doctor asked, What did you do in order to become well? She answered, I went to Father Paisios and St. Pantalemon also helped me. I will dig yet another grave. The saint constantly prayed for specific ailing people, but also for all ill people in general, even though he himself was permanently ill. After his hernia operation in 1988, he began having gastrointestinal hemorrhages, but he never said anything to anyone. By 1991, some three years later, the hemorrhages had become more frequent. He nonetheless continued his ascetic program and concealed his aches and pains. The only thing he was concerned about doing during Great Lent of 1991 was to dig his grave. Up until now, I have dug my grave twice, he noted, once at Stomion and once at the Kali of the Precious Cross, but I didn't die. Now I think I ought to dig yet another grave. When one lives alone, he must be ready to die for the love of Christ, for which reason he must also have his grave dug. Otherwise, if he has not determined that he will die, as soon as he becomes unwell, he will say to himself, You are alone. Be a little lenient with yourself, so that you will not become a burden to anyone else. Conversely, when one has determined that he will die, and has even dug his grave, there is no such reasoning. He can proceed without hesitation. Thus, with spiritual leventia, the elder continued on his ascetic course. While he was digging his grave, a visitor came by and asked, Elder, what are you doing here? I am preparing a layer of soil, he said with a smile. Then he added, I am making my permanent home. The one I have now is temporary. 
exhausted by the frequent hemorrhages, he strove to fulfill the commandment he had received from God, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Because he could hardly walk, oftentimes and with considerable exertion, he barely made it to the fence. There he remained standing, practically hanging over the wires of the fence, while speaking some words of comfort to his waiting visitors. During the summer of 1991, to one group of visitors he said, Palikaria, I will speak to you from here, from the fence. Come a little closer. Let me tell you about what society is like these days. Imagine a man who, while walking on a frozen solid road, suddenly falls and breaks his leg. Imagine the pain that man suffers, especially if he does not go to a doctor. Let's say, however, that he gets up and continues his journey. He falls again and this time breaks his arm. He does the same again. He walks, he again falls and breaks the other leg. As you can see, the man will be wholly malformed with crooked legs and crooked arms. That is what society is like these days. Most people do not know what the church is, what the meaning of confession or Holy Communion is, in order to find the corrective for the great sins into which they fall. Therefore, in order for you to have your spiritual health, you must have your own spiritual father, you must go to church, and you must not forget God. On another day in October of 1991, although the saint heard visitors striking both the bell and the plowshare simultaneously and very persistently, he felt so utterly exhausted that he could not even get out of bed. He then took the icon of St. Arsenios, placed it upon his chest, and said, St. Arsenios, what am I to do? He immediately felt a sense of exaltation and divine strength. The hemorrhage did not stop, but he felt that he had been strengthened and was thus able to receive the visitors. As time went on, however, his condition worsened, and the hemorrhaging became so severe that by January of 1993, he was compelled to go to the outhouse as many as 20 times in one night. The loss of blood was so great that he likened his outhouse to a slaughterhouse. Furthermore, because the outhouse was 20 meters away from the Kalevi, it was a real hardship for him to go back and forth in the cold or in the snow. A few times, he even fainted and fell in the snow. I fell, he remarked, like a wineskin in the smoke. Psalm 118, verse 83 in the Septuagint. Those who knew of his condition were concerned that something might happen when he was alone. He, however, replied, There are so many saints, so many angels. Someone will stand by me in my need. While he was attending divine liturgy in his chapel on the second Sunday of Great Lent in 1993, the elder fainted. The fathers there barely caught him before he fell from the stasidi. They propped him up and told him to sit as his eyes widened and his breathing became so labored that it sounded like a death rattle. When he recovered, he did not want to go to bed or even sit down because the Divine Liturgy was still being celebrated. As soon as the Divine Liturgy had finished, he wanted to treat the visiting fathers. That was his typicon. He did not take, he did not tend to himself even though he himself was fading. His sole concern was the offering of himself to God and to the people. From that time on, his permanent state was one of hemorrhages, fainting spells, and so much pain that it was difficult for him to even sit. He felt as if he was being pierced by nails and needles. There were many times when, due to his feebleness, he was not even able to go to the chapel to get some andiraan. Still, he continued to receive visitors. One day he received some visitors and offered them a treat. He was cheerful and lively. However, shortly afterwards he told them, Well, you have to go now. And he went straight into the Kalivi. They did not leave, however, in the hope that he would return. They then heard such a loud, such loud deep groans that they could not believe that Father Paisios was in such excruciating pain. After a little while, the groan stopped and the elder came out again. Hey, Palikaria, he said to them, 
Are you still here? You have to go now. He was trying to hide just how much he suffered. Just as he, is, he had concealed his virtue, so did he conceal his pain. On another day, two young doctors, seeing the condition he was in, tried to persuade him to go with them to Thessaloniki and be admitted to, the, to a hospital. When they were not successful at persuading him, they asked another friend who happened to be there to make the same suggestion. Let them talk, said the elder. I'm going to drink two glasses of water and it will become blood. Don't worry at all. All day, every day I die and then night falls and the next morning I am resurrected. He had a monastic frame of mind, one of mar martyrdom, heroism. He lived every day as dying and yet behold, he lives. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 One monk also asked, Yerunda, why don't you go to the doctor to see what you have? Well, my child, he replied, I know what I have. I have cancer, but what am I to do? If I begin to run around to the doctors, I won't be able to tend to the patching up of people that I tend to here. Here are some people who suffer, who have problems, come and we say a few prayers, and God patches up a few conditions. If I start running around for my health, I will miss out on those occasional healings. God knows what I have. If it is for the benefit of my soul, He will help me. And to yet another person who asked why he didn't go to the doctors, he answered, Come on, you blessed man. People who are in pain come here. Such pain, such hardship, such expense. Are you suggesting that I go to tend my health, and that those people who are in such pain arrive here to find my door locked? Besides, how am I to go up there to heaven without having been in pain, without having undergone hardship? There, there's no one who has not suffered. If I go as I am without having suffered, I will not be recognizable to anyone. And smiling, he gave him a pat on the back and continued, As a matter of fact, one should suffer hardship. Otherwise, if one lives in comfort, he will not have the heart to die. The saintly elder knew that he had cancer and it would lead him to the true life, the eternal one. He himself had asked it of God. Just as a mother's heart burns as she sees her child burning with fever, and once if it is possible to take on the fever herself and see her child well again, so too did the saint ask God to give him the cancer of the many cancer patients with whom he had met in order to lighten their burden and that of their families. Although his illness troubled him and hindered him in carrying out his daily diaconia, he endured it joyfully because he felt that it was due to the cancer that he could all the more boldly lift up his hands and pray to God. Indeed, he remarked, when one asks with all his heart that God remove the illness of another, God hears him. But if he goes even further and says, give that illness to me, then God is deeply moved and grants what is asked and also gives him a great reward, even though he has not made the request in order to receive a reward. During the summer of 1993, it had been widely rumored that Father Paisius was dying, for which reason more and more people visited him in order to receive his blessing. When he learned of the rumors, he laughed and said, I, ca I cannot even tell a joke. Indeed, the previous winter, someone had noted, the way you are now going, Yeranda, you will soon die. To which he had jokingly replied, I feel cold in my room. How can I get into that grave in such bitterly cold weather? In the summer, in August, that's when I will die. That's when it will be nice and warm. Due to the rumors, someone asked if it were true that he was ill. The elder smiled, caressed him, and with a weak voice said, Nicholas, I can barely move. During the August Lenten season, some of his visitors sensed a fragrance emanating from him, while other visitors saw his face lit up as if he himself were a source of light. During that time, he gave away small wooden icons he had previously made as a blessing. In fact, he had made an abundant amount of wooden icons in order for them to be distributed as a blessing after his death. 
He had left them tidily arranged, along with a note which read, A blessing for people to forgive me when I die. If anyone thinks that he has grieved me, I forgive him, and I ask forgiveness from anyone I may have wronged or upset. Monk Paisios On the 21st of October, 1993, on the old calendar, the elder was present at the feast of the Kali of St. Christodoulos. After the church services had concluded, and while the treat was served, an opportunity arose for him to speak. It was the last time he spoke on the holy mountain. With much anguish, but also with righteous indignation, he spoke about how detrimental roads and motor vehicles will be for the ascetical holy mountain of Athos. He stressed the responsibility that the fathers themselves have to the holy mountain and to the saints who had made it holy, but also to those who will come in the future. Indeed, if they were not careful, he told them, they would leave nothing more than rusted iron sheeting and a completely secularized, worldly way of life for the future generations, whereas the Athenite saints had bequeathed their sacred relics as well as the ascetic and hesychastic tradition to us. Afterwards, even though he was in pain, he went to the monastery of Kutlumusiu in order to offer his good wishes to the abbot, Father Christodoulos, whose name day it was. Since he was to leave the holy mountain the next day for the commemoration of St. Arsenios at the Hesychasterion of the evangelist John the Theologian, he did not stay at Panagura that night, but was instead offered hospitality at a Cali closer to Cariez. There some other fathers who knew him also went to see him. Although he was tired and completely exhausted, the saint was peaceful and cheerful. He talked to them for a long time. The fathers preserved the following statements from him as a last will and testament. The priest has the grace of the priesthood. Even if he is deprived of virtue, that grace empowers him to perform the sacraments. The monk who does not struggle to acquire virtue is deserted by grace. When we wage a war against a passion and that passion does not go away, it reveals either that we have hidden egoism or that we condemn others. An indignation, indication of the authenticity of the inner spiritual state of a person is the fact that he is very strict with himself and lenient with others. Undertake austere struggles now that you are young, because you will not be able to do so later in life. In the past I undertook extreme ascetic struggles, but now I loathe myself. In the past the men who came to the holy mountain in order to become monks placed death before themselves for the love of Christ, and death was afraid of them. Today a mere nosebleed makes us run to the doctors. Unfortunately, today the young are new engines with frozen oil. They want grace without labors. The men of past times lived in accordance with extreme ascetic labors, with self-denial, with obedience. This is the secret to monastic obedience. The monk must cut off his self-will and be obedient to even the youngest monk, to practice not only external, military-like obedience, but an obedience that has a joyful inner disposition for the love of God. The disciple should be all eagerness, and the elder should apply the breaks to him. On the next day, October 22, 1993, on the old calendar, the saint left the holy mountain for the Hesychasterion of the evangelist John. At the Cali of Panagura, he had left his spiritual last will and testament. I, monk Paisios, have examined myself, have found that I have transgressed all the commandments of the Lord. I have committed all the sins. It does not matter that some are committed to a lesser degree, because I have no extenuating circumstances since the Lord has been my great benefactor. Pray that Christ will be merciful to me. Forgive me, and forgiven are also those who think they may have saddened me. Thank you very much, and again, pray for me. Monk Paisios Chapter 13 From Earth to Heaven The Final Return to the Hesychasterion During the eight months that followed, Father Paisios underwent tremendous suffering and endured unbearable pain with a courageous frame of mind. As soon as he arrived at the Hesychasterion, he spoke for a little while to the sisters 
repeating much of what he had said the previous night to the fathers on the holy mountain. At the end he said, Nowadays people are tormented. Since they have no ideals, they do not have spiritual leventia. Thus they do not taste the joy of sacrifice. If this spiritual leventia does not exist even in monasticism, then nothing can be attained. Self-denial is the motivating power in a monk self-denial together with the joy that it provides. It was with absolute self-denial that the elder began his daily program, beginning with the very next day. He received the suffering people who came to visit him and afterwards gave himself over to prayer. The last time at the vigil of St. Arsenius the Cappadocian, on November 9, 1993, Thousands of people came to the Hesychasterion to attend the vigil dedicated to St. Arsenios and to also receive the blessing of Father Paisios. From one o'clock in the afternoon until late at night, he remained in a standing position, receiving the people one by one and giving every single one of them a small cross. The crowd of people was so large that some had to wait for up to six hours in line in order to come before him. At some point, the abbess asked him, Yerunda, all these people want to say something to you, to be told something by you, but there is no time. Are you not troubled over this? He responded, I say to God, my God, I cannot do anything. You must help them. Many requested his prayers to overcome their problems, and he nodded his head in agreement. Others sought some counsel, and he uttered a few words to them. Some prostrated deeply before him, and he strove to restrain them from doing so. Beads of perspiration dripped from his face, from the exertions, and from both the physical and spiritual pain. He, however, had forgotten his own self because he was experiencing the pain of all the waiting people. Even though most people came before him and hastily received only his blessing, the saint observed each person with particular care as if he were the only person to meet with him. He also saw some people with perceptive insight and told them a few divinely enlightened words. At the moment that one woman kissed his hand, she heard him say, You and I shall pray tonight for your child who is far away. The woman was bewildered over that, but she had later learned that that night her son who lived in Germany had suffered a heart attack and had miraculously gotten over the danger. He called another woman by her name and said, What is the matter with you, Oranya? Are you really having surgery? Is it out of fear that you are going? There is nothing wrong with you. The woman was to undergo surgery to remove the polyp in her stomach. However, the medical examinations which were later conducted before the surgery indicated that there was no polyp. Among the gathered people was a young girl who just a few months earlier had been miraculously saved following an accident when her car had fallen into a precipice. As soon as she came before the elder, she was greatly surprised because she recognized him as the unknown monk who had appeared to her the moment she had fallen into the precipice. She told him about the pain that the accident had caused in the back of her neck, and with a gentle movement, the saint made the sign of the cross on her neck three times and said, don't worry, there is nothing wrong. Father, it was you, wasn't it? He bowed his head in silence. I saw your figure as I was falling. It was you, wasn't it, you? The girl repeated. Again, the saint did not reply, but simply said, May Christ and Panagia be with you. As the girl was leaving, she felt an acute pain in her neck, and from that moment on, she never again felt any pain. During the Divine Liturgy, the elder stopped receiving people and went into the church. As he entered, there was an expression of pain on his face and an ascetic vigor as well. He remained standing until the end, and at dawn, when he went to his cell, he did not go to sleep. He asked for the names and the letters the pilgrims had left for him and started to pray for them. The Diagnosis, Radiotherapy, and the Operation On the following day, the condition of the elder's health worsened. 
and fearing that his deteriorating condition might burden others, he agreed to see a doctor. He thus acted in obedience to the ecumenical patriarch, who had recently sent him a message that he undergo medical tests. The diagnosis was immediate. A large malignant tumor was blocking his intestines. Although the doctor hesitated to tell him the results of the diagnostic tests, the elder anticipated him. It is cancer, right? Now you shall do your work, and thereafter it is whatever God says. Yes, Yananda, said the doctor. First we'll do a course of radiotherapy so as to shrink the tumor, and then we'll operate on it. I get it, he replied. First the Air Force will bombard, and then the infantry will attack. He knew that he had cancer and was glad that it had been verified by the examinations. That night he had the sweetest sleep, as he related the next morning. He was also joyful at the thought that some other cancer patients might take comfort in learning that he too was undergoing the affliction of the same disease. Indeed, the saint was suffering, quote, with those who suffer, unquote. Romans 12.15, 1 Corinthians 12.26. He had become a living sacrifice, Romans 12.1. After the doctor's diagnosis, he went to the Theogenio Hospital for radiation therapy every day. He joined the queue of cancer patients without allowing that he be given any priority. As he observed the other cancer patients coming out of the radiation, radiotherapy room, thoroughly worn out, his mind and heart were on them and their problems. Think of it, he said, they cannot work, and their families live in poverty, and they also must face the agony of not knowing if they will live or die. In spite of the difficulties he faced, he met with the entire sisterhood every day. One day the abbess said, Yerunda, you once told us that when we had overcome petty things, you would speak to us about higher spiritual things. What higher spiritual things, he replied. What I see is that the sisters are easily robbed by egoism, pride, and a human-pleasing frame of mind, rather than a God-pleasing frame of mind. That is why I also see the delay in everything, in both the diakonia and in the spiritual things. How else can it be explained that they all should have been razor-sharp by now, given the enormous help they have had? On Christmas Day, he was in great pain, as if he were being cut with a knife. Nevertheless, he called for the sisterhood to assemble. He only commented that he was undergoing a test on patience, and then together with the sisters he chanted the hymn, The great and paradoxical miracle has been accomplished today. Footnote, the first to Kiran, Idiomilon, hymn of the Apostica for the Vespers of Christmas. At one point he interrupted and said, Accentuate, your news should stay there, on that paradoxical miracle. That which provides the accentuation of the heart occurs when the noose dwells on divine meanings. It sets the heart a quiver. Do you know how sweetly you will accentuate should you move into the more profound meaning? We must acquire your spirit, Yaranda, said the abbess. Spirits, spirits, he replied. Look, some people who play musical instruments drink a little and sing with gusto. In other words, spirits are their primary motivators. You, however, must be motivated by the Spirit, the divine fire, and the Holy Spirit. The countenance of the saint had been divinely altered. He, uh, the utterly weak elder had become strong as the strength of his soul gave strength to his weak body. Although his entire body was trembling, he started to chant again. Divine longing had overcome physical pain. The sisters asked him whether a person in a state of divine eros can feel physical pain. He replied, If the pain is excruciating, it becomes endurable. If it is intense, it becomes less, and if the pain is weak, it vanishes. In sighing, he continued, Alas, that flame has yet to kindle within you. During the vigil of January 1st, 1994, he remained, remained standing the entire time 
but was in great pain later. From time to time his intestine also troubled him. Now my elder is the cancer, he said. The cancer gives me my orders. By merely enduring the pain, you are reminded of the holy martyrs and you forget the pain. But when you have to go out every 10 or 15 minutes and interrupt your program, it is a nuisance. I want nothing other than to have at least two hours without interruption. He was even troubled by the least provision of care for him. On the first day of the new year, he said, if a monk does not sense the sweetness of arduousness, he cannot thrive. Due to the care now provided to me, I feel twice as ill. Oh, if only I had a little courage. I wish I had two years to live slightly monastically. Yerunda, what more would you do during those two years? One of the sisters asked. In Greece there is always bright sunshine, said the saint. Rarely do the Greeks work with lights on during the day. If a Greek d goes to England, where it is always cloudy, and he works with the lights on during the day, he will be distressed. The British people are not upset at all, because they do not understand or know about ever-present sunshine. Do you understand? The elder used the word in Greek, which sounds like the English phrase, all right, whenever he wanted to say, do you see with spiritual vision? Do you have experience in something spiritual? Another sister asked him, does humility prompt a monk to lead an austere way of life? Love does, love, replied the saint very sweetly, and continued, humility is needed in order to maintain love. When the course of radiotherapy had been completed, he thought about returning to the holy mountain and entreated God to enlighten him about what to do. And while he was in an anticipatory state, he seemed to be experiencing an intensely divine love. He was often heard to speak loudly with Christ, Panagia, the saints. He frequently repeated the expression, My sweet little mother, in reference to Panagia. He held her icon tightly to his chest, kissed it with fervent yearning, and said, And as each of us has surpassing love for his mother, even more fervently ought we to love the Lord. Footnote, the second troparion of the third antiphon of the Anavathmi of the fourth mode. Oftentimes he was engrossed in the sweet immersion of prayer, and it was obvious that he had been transported to heaven. He also frequently repeated the phrase, I am burning, commander, sir, I am burning. That was what a soldier had said to his commanding officer when he apologized for having abandoned his military post to go and pray. The saint was also burning with the flame of divine love. I have become a portion of love, he said one day to the abbess. What portion of love, Yeranda? A wellspring of divine love, she said to him. Something like a fountain, he confided, an inexhaustible spring of love. It wells up unceasingly. Human love is like eating a sweet, and then there is no more, whereas divine spiritual interaction is an enormous thing and long-lasting. The operation was scheduled for February 4th. In the meantime, the elder underwent pre-surgical tests. On one of the ensuing days, January 27, 1994, he seemed very happy. Everything indicates that I'll take leave, that I'll die, he said with a smile. On that day, Metropolitan Senesios of Casandrea visited him and saw a column of supernatural light shining brightly within him. As he was leaving, he said, Holiness cannot be hidden, radiant. A little later, Archbishop Demianos of Sinai came as well and told him that his hesychastic Kali at Tarfa was ready. The elder was immediately galvanized, and as soon as the archbishop left, he joyfully said, The route to Sinai has opened for me. What, am I to stay here and die like a dog in the vineyard? I will go there and live monastically and die with Palikadiya. During the following days, he constantly asked, Any news? Any other news? And he himself replied, 
You have not heard anything. That's all. Finally, on February 1st, the results of the pre-surgical examinations were released. They revealed that the cancer had metastasized to the lungs and the liver. When the abbess told him of the results, he offered her his handkerchief and said to her joyfully, Get up, Yerandisa, get up to dance. He was entirely alight with excessive joy. She wept, but Father Paisios asked her, Why do you weep? Are seventy years not enough for one to live? After he had received the results, he preferred that the operation not take place. The doctors, however, said that in spite of the metastases, he needed to have the operation because otherwise he would develop an intestinal obstruction. He thus decided to obey. The surg surgery took place on February 4th. The tumor was removed, an ileostomy pouch was temporarily attached, and localized chemotherapy was administered to the liver. Immediately after the surgery, the elder was transferred to the intensive care unit. After recovering from the anesthesia, he was very calm. To the doctor who persistently asked him about the intensity of pain he felt, in order to determine the dosage of pain medication, he responded, I have no pain at all. The doctor was puzzled until the sisters explained that the elders not at all meant not much, and if he had said that he had a little pain, it meant that he was in great pain. When he was transferred out of the intensive care unit, many people began to go to the hospital to see him and receive his blessing. The hospital was then compelled to take safety measures. Nevertheless, people could not easily be restrained from flocking there. Many waited for hours, hoping to have an opportunity to see the countenance of Father Paisios, even it was if it was through the slightest opening of the door. One day, a woman accompanied by her husband went to the hospital at 4.30 in the morning, believing that there would not be a crowd at that time. However, they found about 30 young people in the waiting room. The woman headed for the room of Father Paisios, pushed a little at the half-open door, and saw him lying on the bed. The elder turned to look at her, summoned her to him, and gave her his blessing. As soon as the woman came out into the corridor, the young men who were waiting there ran up to her to receive the blessing of Father Paisios through her. The patient in the hospital bed next to the elder commented, The joy of those entering the room was so great that it was like they had just won a lottery, or as if they were given something precious. Indeed, what greater treasure exists than the holy blessings of holy people? Whoever entered the room saw not only a patient who was suffering as a human being, but one who endured as a saint. The elder did not pay any attention to his pain, nor did he speak to anyone about his health. All of his concern was focused upon others, and he spread divine joy to whoever was blessed to be there. A young man asked him, Elder, are you hurting? If I do not hurt, he replied, how am I to get well? Another visitor asked him if he was afraid of death. I have spent a lifetime striving to draw close to God, he replied. And am I to become cowardly now? If I were told that I will die at this very moment, I will dance with joy because I will go near Christ. Sometimes through the grace of God, the saint knew the people waiting outside the room. A doctor from Athens had driven with his father-in-law an entire night to visit him. When they arrived at the hospital at daybreak, they learned that he was in a lot of pain. They then implored a nun, who was there to ask for his blessing on their behalf. The nun went in and shortly thereafter returned with a smile and asked, Are you perhaps the son and the father-in-law? You have the blessing of the elder. The saint had, quote-unquote, seen who they were, the effort they had put in to meet him and their philotomo and not wanting to bother him. A priest who had insisted on going into the room was deeply moved as soon as he saw the elder, and joyfully said, Yerunda, there are many times that I very much wanted to come and see you on the holy mountain, but didn't manage it. Do not misunderstand me 
for crying and laughing. I feel like a small child. That's why I came myself, Father Photios, to your neighborhood, answered the saint. The priest was amazed and he knew his, that he knew his name and that his home was near the hospital. There were instances when the saint invited people who had not asked to see him into his room. One day he invited a patient from another floor. Astonished, he asked the nurse who had summoned him, From where does he know me? What does he want from me? What does he want me for? When he went, however, to his amazement, Father Paisios told him that his desire for his son to have a son will be fulfilled, but that he himself will not be alive at that time. Shaken, the patient returned to his room. He had long beseeched God, Grant me only a grandchild, even if I do not live to see him. At another time, while the saint was in the hospital corridor, he called to a young woman who had gone to the hospital to visit her friend who was a cancer patient. Why, my child, are you involved in yoga techniques? He kindly asked her. Isn't our orthodox religion sufficient for you? We have the truth, the living God. She wondered at the unknown monk who spoke to her as if he knew her. She then took her friend to show her the monk. The saint also gave her his blessing and told her that he will pray for her health. A few days later, the cancer patient repeated the medical examinations and they revealed that the tumor had disappeared. It was only natural that many doctors and other staff at the hospital visited the room of Father Paisios. Upon entering, they found themselves in a different atmosphere, a spiritual one. The elder did not ask the doctors about the course of his illness. He obeyed whatever he was told, and to thwart them in fussing over him, he told them jokes. The most humble people are you doctors, he said to some of them. You work for the SC. Uh, therefore you have no egoism, and your pension association is Tsai. Footnotes. These are Greek acronyms for Ethnico Sistema Yeyas, or the National Health System, which sounds like SC, the Greek word for you, the other. And the Pension and Self Insured Treasury of Health Workers acronym, which sounds like Tsai, the Greek word for T. Therefore, you are frugal in your diet since you are sustained with only Tsai, T. The doctors often asked him how to deal with the cancer patients. You should make them aware of their condition, he advised them, and encouraged them to confess and receive Holy Communion. Holy Communion is the strongest medicine. He gave many small crosses to the nurses in order for them to pass them out to the patients. One of the nurses mocked the other nurses who went to the elder to receive the small crosses. One day she too went to him out of curiosity the saint pointed to a chocolate on the nightstand and told her, Take this chocolate, it is for you. He did not give her any crosses, however, something which gave her pause. Seeing so many people waiting for hours to see a monk, a male nurse commented, And what is this Paisios that makes them go and venerate him? One day he too knocked on the door and told the nun who was there, I came to help the elder. Then the saint shouted from his bed, You should go back to your wife. The nurse realized what he meant, for he had left his wife and was living with another woman. He was visibly shaken by that incident and said, I don't know what this Paisios is, nevertheless he is indeed something. Two days before he left the hospital, Father Paisios put on his cassock, picked up his monastic bag, and visited all the patients on his floor to hand out crosses. In one ward, he said, All of you will get well, except for me. In another ward, someone told him, Oh, dear father, I want to get well and live. If, only I, I, if I only knew the secret, he replied with a smile, I would also do something for myself. The saint had supposed that the good thoughts people had about him would be spoiled since he had cancer, and that they might say, since he cannot heal himself, what good can we expect from him? However, more and more people flocked to him. 
When he left the hospital, he came out of his room accompanied by his doctor. Immediately, many people gathered around him, patients, doctors, nurses, and visitors. One patient who was connected to intravenous tubes bent to kiss his hand, but the elder anticipated him and bent to kiss his hand first. Before he entered the lift, he raised his hand and waved goodbye to all. Many then ran down the stairs to the ground floor to see him for the last time. He proceeded hastily with the doctor without saying anything. It was snowing when they got out into the courtyard of the hospital, but the people gathered around the car that was to transfer the elder. The nurse called out to the people to clear the way, and thus the elder was able to enter the car. After that, the gathered people touched the car windows in farewell, some with tears in their eyes. The elder was so deeply moved by the love of the people. As the doctor was closing the door of the car, the elder turned to him and said, I would like to live a little longer. Out of an abundance of love for his fellow human beings, the saint wanted to live in order to suffer with them and to exert himself in anguished prayer for them. His philotimo was so boundless that he preferred to suffer on earth rather than to rejoice in paradise, where there is neither sickness nor sorrow nor sighing, but life everlasting. From the Kentuckian of the Funeral Service. Twenty years earlier, in a later letter he had written, even though true monks realize that the joy they experience in this life is only a sampling of the joy of paradise, and that it will be greater in paradise, out of love for their neighbor they nonetheless wish to live on earth in order to help people with prayer, so that God will intervene and the people will receive the help they need. On February 18th, three days after his return to the Hezekasterion, the saint received a visitation from St. Pantalemon in his cell. He saw him entirely alive before him as a young doctor, wearing a white apron, just as he had appeared to him fifteen years earlier. And although the elder was in a lot of pain, the divine visitation gave him a sense of great relief and divine joy. As soon as he had somewhat recovered from the surgery, he gave in to the insistence of the doctors and began a course of chemotherapy. He suffered a great deal, but he was patient and believed that the suffering was from God for his benefit. With this trial, God must want something, he said. He is executing a spiritual job on me that is higher than any other I myself have done until this point in my life. On another day, he said, I heard the word chemotherapy and thought it was chemotherapy or footnote is a play with the words chemotherapy in chemotherapy. That is therapy for cancer patients with chemos or juice with natural foods. Chemos is a word, Greek word for juice. Now, however, I understand what a terrible ordeal it really is. I had said to the ailing, for whatever is humanly possible, let it be done. For whatever is not humanly possible, we will pray to God for, for help. However, I didn't know how many procedures were required for people to be helped humanly. I had to go through this ordeal in order to understand. I have now acquired tremendous experience. I have seen that what is achieved by human means is not at all simple. People undergo torment and end up patched back together. On the other hand, if Christ caresses a person lightly on the arm, everything goes away and he becomes well. After that, there is no need for medicines or poisons. Medicines is pharmaka and poisons pharmakia. And if Christ caresses him on the face, so much the better. And if he also embraces him, then even his heart will be softened. This is why we should pray for Christ to help the people and not be contented with the idea that one is in the hands of good doctors. In the end, the elder discontinued the chemotherapy because the doctors had realized that his body would not endure it. As soon as he began to feel better, he again started to receive people. One day, a three-month-old infant who had a problem with his kidneys was brought to him. The saint asked what the doctors had said and if the child received Holy Communion. When he was told that they were going to baptize the child in a week, he said, 
Why do you delay in baptizing your children? St. Arsenios baptized me at the age of 13 days. Go baptize the child so that he can receive Holy Communion and everything will go well. The parents took the infant from the hospital and had him baptized. A few days later, the doctors ascertained that the child had no problem at all. On another day, the sisters asked Father Paisios to pray for a young engineer who was in critical condition after having fallen from a great height while working. The saint asked for three large candles and requested that no one disturb him. The next day, even though the young man was in intensive care, he was told that Father Paisios was praying for him. I know that, he said. He was just here. He caressed me on the shoulder and said, Don't worry, you are seriously injured, but you'll recover. The young man did not entirely get well, but he continued to work as usual. He has a family and glorifies God because due to the, his ordeal, he understood the deeper meaning of life. The Martyrdom of Physical Pain In April of 1994, the elder was again admitted to the hospital so that the normal functioning of his intestine could be restored. The doctor's opinion was that he undergo a colectomy, but the elder did not want to do so. He wanted to have the intestine restored as soon as possible for the added reason that he wanted to put an end to the doctor's efforts. To one priest who had visited him in the hospital, he said, Up until now I have acted in obedience to the patriarch and gone to the doctors. Now I will leave everything up to God. During the days that followed, however, he went through a terrible martyrdom of excruciating pain. The continually increasing metastases of the cancer to the liver resulted in the swelling of the liver and constant unbearable pain and the metastasis to the lungs caused dyspnea. Both the radiation therapy and the surgery had inflamed his intestine which caused him intense searing pain and also further hindered the intestine's ability to function regularly. The pain was so strong that the saint himself was often jolted by it as perspiration trickled down his face and tears flowed from his eyes. One day he asked, These tears are neither tears of repentance nor tears of exaltation. Where do they belong? Aren't they tears of martyrdom, Yerunda? One of the sisters asked. Well, what else can they be? He responded and immediately rejoined, I am paying off my sins. I will now need twenty years to pay off my sins. Those pains were indeed a baptism of martyrdom, and the saint endured them with the mindset of a martyr and glorified God. For entire nights while he was in pain, he chanted because the pain, as he said, became less that way. He often chanted with divine fervor, Be entreated, O Lord, by the suffering your servants endured for you. He stopped after that verse and did not chant the rest of the hymn, and heal your every pain, our every pain, O lover of humankind, we pray you. Footnote. The Apolitikion of the Holy Forty Martyrs, martyred in the city of Sebastia. They are commemorated on the 9th of March. He resembled the holy martyrs who, chanting with joy, had run to martyrdom and considered it a great detriment to be delivered from it. In a similar manner, the saint had run to his martyrdom out of love for his neighbor. Thus it was that as he suffered, he said to himself, Was it not you who had said, My God, give me the illness, and then no matter how much I weep or scream, do not listen to me, be deaf to my cries? What will you say now? My God, make me well? He never took painkillers except when the pain became excruciating. One day he showed the sisters a small piece of folded paper and said, I took my pill tonight. They took the paper and unfolded it, but it had nothing inside. Read what it says on the outside, he said. They turned it over and saw that he had written the forty martyrs. The elder explained what intense pain the holy forty martyrs suffered in the frozen lake. I myself am in my bed. I have heat. I have oxygen. I have everything. During that time, one of the sisters was suffering with a great deal of pain which had been caused by shingles. 
footnote shingles, which is caused by the varicella zoster virus, is a disease that affects the nerves by causing burning and shooting pain, itching, or blisters. One day she employed, implored the elder to pray that she not be in pain during Great Lent. Blessed sister, he replied, one who wants to get well is not well. Who ever heard of such a thing, that you don't want to be in pain during Lent so that you can experience Lent? Actually, we monastics should be begging for pain so that we can take the pains of the lay people upon ourselves in order for God to grant consolation to them. To a lay person, however, the saint said, Don't ask for it. Don't ask for it. You cannot bear the pain. It is terrible pain. The man was perplexed because he had actually asked God to give him a little of Father Paisius' illness. The elder not only endured the pain with fortitude and doxology, but he also tried to amuse the sisters so that they would not worry as they watched him suffer. One day when he was in intense pain and had difficulty in breathing, he said, Is there a harmonica somewhere? The doctor says that in order for the lungs to open up and to live many years, one must play the harmonica. They found a harmonica, and when they took it to him, he said, where do you have it? Where did you have it all this time? Whenever I have dys, dyspnea, I will play it. He tested it out a little, and then he started playing the hymn, O oh, Give Thanks Unto the Lord, Psalm 135. At the end, he said, I learned to play the harmonica when I was 10 years old, and now as soon as I played a little, I immediately recalled it. I became ten years old again in order to play. The same was amused with the pain. He was amused with his suffering. He was amused with death, which he waited with joy. Charan is my joy. Joy is kara. Footnote Charan. In Greek mythology is the ferryman who brought the souls of the dead across the river Styx or the river Acheron to Hades. One day he said, I will now leave from Zoe, the name of a Christian brotherhood, and go to Soter, the name of another Christian brotherhood. Footnote, Zoe in Greek means life, and Soter means redeemer. One Christian brotherhood in Greece bears the name Zoe, and another the name the Soter. In other words, I will now leave life and go to the Savior. He was so united with Christ the Savior that it, this life, this temporal world, had no hold on him. Nor did paradise concern him. He had already experienced paradise from this life, and thus wherever God sent him, he would be grateful. He declared, How many people who had not seen even a little joy in this life will go to hell? It would be too demanding of me to desire to go to paradise after having experienced so many spiritual joys. Thus enduring to the end the humble and philotima filled thoughts, and with a heart replete with joy and hope in God, Father Paisios indicated how one who loves God and sees this life as a passage to the other, the true and eternal life, departs for heaven. He had understood this true meaning of life from the time he was an eight-year-old child. It had been later taught to him by Christ himself when he had appeared to him holding the Holy Gospel, open to the verse, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 11, 25-26 He had kept that image before him during the war when he had preferred to be killed himself so that others could survive. He had lived by that verse throughout his entire monastic life, joyful at dying for the spiritual things, as well as for the things requiring physical labor. He had also affirmed it at Panaguda during his final years there when he had asked the suffering people, Why do you worry? Is it for earth that we are bound? He experienced it as he prayed to God for them. Take the pain from your creature and give it to me. But he proclaimed it most brilliantly from his bed of pain during the last months of his life as a preacher with a clarion call, while all the while he was illuminated from within by the joy of the resurrection. He consoles others instead of being consoled. 
Outside the cell where he lived in the Hezekasterion, the visitors waited in line for hours. As each one entered, they found him peaceful, luminous, heading toward death with joyful feet. Even though he was slowly fading away, he was all the more, more radiant. There were times that his eyes flashed like lightning. He was at once full of grace and beautiful. He overflowed with cheerfulness and simplicity. One day, although he was in great pain, and in his bed and on his knees, he made an exception and agreed to see a family from Crete. I just love you Cretans, he said heartily, because you are completely mad. You have the good madness. They hastened to leave him so as not to tire him, but he kept asking them about other Cretans he knew. His vigor did not reveal a person who was to die shortly. He would not have stopped talking to them if they themselves had not interrupted him and said, Give us your blessing, Yerunda, for we have tired you. He bid them farewell, wishing them a meeting in paradise. On another day, he received some children who had brought him wildflowers, and as he was lying down, placed them at his side. Have you seen what the children have done? He asked with a bright smile. They can see from afar. When they asked him if he was in pain, he replied, We should have something in order to take a test. Many visitors told him that they were praying for his health, but he instead asked them to pray that he gets at least a passing grade in the difficult exams he was taking. Others expressed their wish that he get well. I don't want to get well, he responded. For me, death is a festival. If I knew that I was to die tonight, I would dance to the song that says, Farewell, poor world. Footnote. The first verse of the Greek folk song, The Dance of Zalongo, in 1803, 57 women from Suli in the Epirus region, rather than fall captive to the Ottoman Turks, chose to throw first their children and then themselves off of Mount Zalongo. History commemorates their sacrifice as the Dance of Zalongo. At another point, some other women from Suli threw themselves into a river and drowned in order to avoid captivity and enslavement to the Ali Pasha's troops. The families of two Pomaks, who had become Christians, also came to receive his blessing. Pray for me to die, said the elder to the wife of one of them. Yerunda, she replied, if you die, what will become of us? We will be orphans. You will not be orphans, he responded. Don't you believe in the resurrection of Christ? We will be together. I will wait for you there, but I will be with you even here. One day he asked a bishop who had visited him, Have you brought any letters? What he meant was whether he had brought any requests that he could transmit to God, since he was soon to be in his presence. Yerunda, what letters? he asked. Didn't you write any? All right, then. Pay for the postage stamps. And he continued, if I find boldness before God, I will be close to you. These are the words of a saint, which were backed by the surety of an entire lifetime of ascetic struggle in the spiritual mind and the martyrdom of pain wrought by illness. He was often visited by the doctor who had operated on him, as well as by the oncologist who was following up on him. The elder used to tell them jokes in order to dissipate their sadness while in every way he wanted to express his gratitude. He was upset that the sisters had delayed in painting the icons that he wanted to give the doctors as a blessing. Whenever you see a philotomo-filled person, he said, you should respect his philotomo. You should think about how these people are to be rewarded. Whenever I feel a sense of obligation towards someone, I cannot sleep until I have settled my obligation to him. Otherwise, how does a human differ from an ox? One day he spoke to the doctor about St. Natalia and St. Ad Adrianos. They are commemorated the 26th of, 6th of August. St. Natalia, he told her, was present at the martyrdom of St. Adrianos and encouraged him, while she simultaneously incited the executioners to give him more painful tortures so that the martyr could obtain a greater crown of glory. In the end, she too was martyred, 
Back then, many women attended the martyrdoms in order to encourage the martyrs, and in doing so, were also beaten by the torturers. Likewise, you doctors, conclude the elder, prolong the martyrdom of the ailing, but it does not matter. They will receive a greater reward from God. Of course, you also take part in their martyrdom, but at least you are not beaten for it. On another day, he gave the oncologist a lyre for her services. It was a simple coin wrapped in paper on which he had written, An Official Lyre. The elder also gave such lyres to the sisters who ministered to him. I am now eating from my accumulated resources, he said. These lyres or leers have truly saved me in my old age. That was the manner in which he wanted to teach them that whoever labors spiritually in his youth is wealthy in his old age, with a spiritual treasury full of virtues and divine gifts. An ascetic until his last breath. St. Paisios, nonetheless, continued to work and to tire himself. He alone tended to his personal hygiene, which as an ascetic he had simplified, while he constantly found ways to minister to himself and to continue his ascetic struggle. Sometimes he asked for a stool, and other times for a pillow, or for a hanger in order to hang whatever he needed near his bed. Until June, one month before his falling asleep, he did prostrations by using a stool on which he leaned. Afterwards, he asked for a large wooden board, which he then placed on his head in order to kneel upon its surface. Every day, he read all the names and the letters that had been sent to him. He never slept before having finished all of them. I leave no work for the next day, he commented. One night, one of the sisters did not give him all the sheets of paper with the names which had been brought by the pilgrims because she did not want to tire him. Instead, she had placed them beneath his pillow with the belief that even in that way, God would help the people. When the saint found them, however, he remarked, the people cannot be helped in a magical manner. One afternoon, a few days later, one of the sisters knocked on the door of his cell, and although she had not heard him answer, Amen, she slowly and quietly opened it. She then saw him as he stood before the iconostasis, whispering in a plaintive tone, as he read the names of people aloud. He was immersed in pain and supplication. The sister closed the door and knocked again, but louder. The elder said, Amen, and as soon as he saw her, he began to play the fool. He said incoherent things and laughed whilst clapping his hands. That event alone was sufficient for one to understand him. He was an ascetic, dauntless, and silent. During the divine liturgies, no matter how much pain he was in, he remained standing, leaning lightly on the stasidi. He did not leave until the very end. He stayed to hear the prayers of thanksgiving after Holy Communion, because he considered it a matter of great contempt and ingratitude to God to have received Holy Communion and leave immediately thereafter. He also did not want the church services to be shortened for his sake. He was exact and noble in all things. Of course, he would have liked to have gone to the Sinai Desert before the end of his life and to ascend to other spiritual heights with ascetic fearlessness. Less than two months before his falling asleep, he had said, If I did not have what I have, who knows where I would be now? I would be doing crazy things. I may be tied down in this way, but I still haven't given up hope. Nevertheless, the hand of the good God raised him to the spiritual heights in a different way. With the humility brought on by physical weakness and the patience with which he confronted his pain, and the saint was not merely obedient to the plan of God, but he accepted it with joy and thanksgiving, believing that it was the most beneficial one for him. And he reached the point of saying, The martyrizing pain of my illness has benefited me far more than the ascetic struggles of my life. He also said, Not one of my ascetic disciplines helped me as much as my illness. I have been humbled and have got to the point of loathing myself. It was a tremendously humbling experience for the austere and indomitable ascetic to have undergone surgeries, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, 
medical treatments, a fixed doctor prescribed diet, and even the little care with which he was provided. Some years earlier, however, he himself had written, I examine my spiritual root and the trivial struggles in which I have been engaged, sometimes with discernment and other times without discernment, motivated nonetheless by divine zeal. I have come to the following conclusion. The shortest, surest, and easiest route to the heavenly Jerusalem is humility. It is true that I do not have any, but I will struggle in this area, and may God help me. Preparation for the Desired Departure On May 11th, the feast day of St. Glicaria, while the saint was in the midst of a gathering with the sisters, there was a moment when he appeared to become preoccupied as if he were engrossed by something. Divine grace illumined his face, and although his radiant eyes were fixed upon an icon of Panagia, he was not looking at it. For three or four minutes he remained in that position, and when he came to, as it were, he asked, Did you hear angelic psalmodies? The sisters had seen him in a similar condition a few days earlier, but he had not said anything then. He also heard angelic psalmodies one afternoon, at the time Vespers was being celebrated in the church of St. Arsenios, even though he was in his cell. At first he thought the psalmody was coming from the church, but when the psalmody rose in volume, he heard the slow, Holy, 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 Lord of Sabaoth. Angels chanted the hymn unceasingly and very sweetly, and the saint listened ecstatically and felt, as he said, a sweet immersion and a heavenly blessedness. He even supposed that the time had come for him to leave this life. From that day on, he asked the sisters to chant the Holy, Holy, Holy Lord of Sabaoth, and he showed them how to start chanting softly and to gradually become louder, just as he had heard it from the angels. He insisted that the melodious turns be chanted sweetly, and the codas fade away smoothly and beautifully. Footnote, the elder used the word yerismata to refer to the stylistic quote-unquote turns, that is the vocal melodic patterns of va or variations of Byzantine music, which are usually indicated with the characters of quality or expression and which contribute to the adornment and beauty of melodies. He wanted them to chant the hymn not only with accentuation, but also with the simplicity of of sotto voce, and he demanded great precision throughout. The smallest mistake distracted him from the prayer of the heart, as if the notes had been written upon his own heart. And when he himself chanted the hymn, one did not hear human psalmody, but something heavenly. It was an overflowing doxology from a heart that had itself become heaven. At the end of May, Father Paisios decided to return to the Holy Mountain. He also announced his decision to the doctors who, however, insisted on his being transferred by an ambulance because the journey was to last seven hours and he needed an oxygenator every two hours. The elder, however, did not want to take an ambulance to the Holy Mountain. To the, to the oncologist, he said, even if I were dead, I do not want to travel to the Holy Mountain in a motor vehicle because I struggled to prevent motor vehicles from entering the Paravalia the Panagia. And now some will exploit the presence of an ambulance in order to justify the presence of minibuses wandering about the Holy Mountain. Although he had decided upon the day of his departure, his condition worsened. The pain in the Dispnoi had intensified. He required oxygen more and more frequently and his strength was gradually fading. He realized that, humanly speaking, it was impossible for him to return to the Holy Mountain. Nor did he want to die on the way to the Holy Mountain and create an uproar around his person. Just as he had lived modestly, so did he also want to die and be buried modestly and quietly. He therefore decided to be buried quietly at the Hesychasterion and told the abbess to ask the blessing of the local bishop. He, upon hearing the request, gave his blessing and said, He lived quietly, it is only right that he also depart quietly. Thus humbly and with the fear of God, the saint arranged this matter as well. 
After having made that decision, on the night of June 10th, he had severe pain and palpitations. He thought that the time of his death had come, and with all his might he chanted the Trisagion on him, The meat is it in truth, the holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth, the in thee rejoiceth, O thou who art full of grace, every created being, and the hail, O queen. Two days later, on June 12th, on the feast day of St. Onufrius, he asked for the Menaean and read aloud with all his heart the Ecos of St. Onufrius. O love, the light of the most resplendent, O chief of all the virtues, ever and always do you fill the heavenly host with grace and exaltation. O love, which dwells in the holy patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, through their prayers may you also dwell in us, so that with them we sing to God, Alleluia. Two or three days later, the saint saw Panagia pass by his cell, just as he had seen her a few years earlier. She came out of the iconostasis, passed over the bed and disappeared into the opposite wall, leaving him with an inexpressible joy and heavenly exaltation in his soul. From the middle of June onward, he received very few visitors. One day, after he had received some visitors, he also received his doctor. The doctor saw that he was grieved and said, Yerunda, why are you distressed? We know that you love all the people. Why are you saddened? Although pain was written all over his face, Father Paisios looked at him with a smile, shook his head and said, The love, the love, the love. If it were not for love, who knows which cave I would have been tamping about, tramping about. As an ascetic citizen of heaven, he would have liked to have lived as a vagabond for Christ's sake, unknown to people and known only to God, and recorded only on God's list of monks, but his love for the suffering people kept him close to them. On June 15th, he spoke with the abbess about how and where he wanted his grave to be. He asked that his body never be exhumed, just as his elder father Tikhon had also asked. He also asked that his angelic habit and monastic hood be brought to him from Panaguda. When the fathers went there, they found that the clothes for his funeral had been readied, along with a note which read, These are for the funeral. It would please me if you put the old ones on me, and keep the new, because I am a wretch. May God have mercy on me through your prayers. Pray for me, Monk Paisios. After he had arranged everything on June 21st, he decided to stop taking any medication. You must now let me go. It is time for me to go, he said to the doctors. But why, Yerunda? the surgeon asked. Because I cannot do even one prostration. I tried to kneel, but I was unable. I must go. The doctors advised him not to stop taking the medication. The oncologist insisted that he at least take the cortisone and explained that cortisone does not prolong life, but instead helps a patient care for himself until the end. The elder, however, did not retreat from his decision, for he wanted to stop consuming even the little amount of food he was taking in. On the next day, June 24th, the feast day of the Nativity of St. John the Forerunner, he went to divine liturgy with considerable difficulty. After having received Holy Communion, he immediately left for his cell because he could no longer stand due to the pain and great weakness. He implored the sisters to telephone the oncologist to ask for her forgiveness over his insistence that he forsake all medication and began to take the cortisone again. The same day he wrote a few verses and asked that they be engraved on a small marble plaque to be placed over his grave. Here life ended. Here too I breathe my last. Here the body will bury, buried be, and my soul will rejoice at last. My saint dwells here. It is an honor for me. I believe that he will pity my own wretched soul. To the Redeemer will he pray that Panagia with me stay. Monk Paisios the Athenite. Afterwards, the saint refused all solid food. He drank only fluids, as his elder father Tikhon 
had done during the last days of his life. Naturally, he gradually began to lose his strength. On the eve of June 28, he remarked, I've become a total wreck. Let's see, will I be able to attend church and receive Holy Communion tomorrow? One of the sisters then said, Let's get through the night first. Upon hearing that remark, the elder, as if gaining strength, sat up and said, What did you say? I may not get through the night. If I don't see the dawn, I will have a very long day. It will never have a night. Keep the sun for yourselves. Then another sister remembered a poem that went like this. Can what we consider a sunset be perhaps a sweet dawn elsewhere? Instead of a night without a dawn, a day will dawn without a night? Can the truth be in death, and life be hiding the error? Can what we say is living be dead and immortal what has died? Footnote, Georgios Jocinis, What Then? from the collection Bright Darknesses, a Greek poet and prose writer, 859-1951. He enjoyed that poem so much that he clapped his hands and asked that she recite it a second time. On the next day, the Feast of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, the saint attended divine liturgy for the last time. That night the sisterhood had their final gathering with him. His final words to them were, Pray that I find what I desire, and I, should I find boldness before God, will pray that you receive whatever you request in accord with God. During the thirteen days that followed, the saint endured excruciating pain. He was silent with his head inclined toward the icon of Panagia, which was beside him, and he seemed to be praying. Occasionally he said, My Jesus, my Panagia, from time to time he opened his thin and feeble hands and said, My sweet Panagia. He had stopped reading the letters that had been sent to him. He asked only for the prayers with the list of names, which he quickly glanced over. One day he said, When I see the word cancer written on a sheet of paper, I stop. How it hurts. During those days he wore his rasso when he received Holy Communion in his cell. Weak yet calm and serene, he prepared for the coveted departure. On July 4th, all the sisters visited his cell in order to receive his blessing. To those whom he had occasionally scolded, he whispered humbly, beseechingly in a fading voice, Forgive me. That was his last sermon, Repentance and Humility. Yesterday, O Christ, was I buried with Thee. On Tuesday, July 11th, the feast day of St. Euphemia, the same received Holy Communion for the last time. With great exertion, he kneeled on his bed, made the sign of the cross, and with quivering lips said, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. The sisters brought him the icon of St. Euphemia and the tray with the coliva for her feast day. But no kaliva, it's the custom among Orthodox to bring a tray of boiled wheat kernels to church in commemoration of the saint being celebrated on that day. He took two particles of grain on the tips of his fingers as a blessing and kissed the icon of the saint. Seeing that the icon was not decorated with flowers, he remarked, You haven't put even a single flower on her? At noon, the Archbishop of Sinai, Damianos, came to the Hesychasterion, and the elder asked him to read the prayer for the parting of the soul from the body. He also requested that he commemorate him. Commemorate me, he said, because many others will abandon me. They will suppose that I do not need any prayers. That final night was one of martyrdom. Even the strongest pain-killing drugs could not help him. I am in pain, a lot of pain, he said softly as he constantly looked at the icon of Panagia. His right hand occasionally formed the sign of the cross, while his left hand moved as if he was holding a kambaskini. From time to time he opened his hands as if in prayer. At one point he uttered, Martyrdom. 
the abbess who was next to him did not hear him and asked him what he had said. He repeated thrice, martyrdom, martyrdom, martyrdom. Drenched in sweat, he, he gasped for breath. His tears soaked, he ran his final lap to the finish line so as to receive the crown of victory. He who had lived an angelic life on earth raced through martyrdom in order to fly to the heavenly tabernacles. At 9.30 in the morning, all the sisters went to receive his blessing for the last time. His eyes were fixed on the icon of Panagia and did not speak. Pain was written all over his face. He breathed with great difficulty as his blood pressure fell gradually lower. All things indicated that he was approaching the end. The spiritually resurrected Father Paisios was on the threshold of eternal blessedness. In a split second, the saint took three quick breaths and went out as the light of a vigil oil lamp goes out when its oil is spent. His head turned peacefully to the side as his sanctified soul flew to his true native land to heaven. It was 11 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, July 12th, 1994. The sisters put his angelic habit on him as well as his outer cassock and his monastic hood. He had arranged everything else by himself. They placed him in a simple bier and carried him to the chapel of the archangels. They placed only a few flowers, basil and roses around him. His hands as if alive devoutly held the cross. His countenance was peaceful, luminous and venerable. There was a merriness about him. Grace emanated from him. In the afternoon, the Hezekasterion was open for the pilgrims, but the sisters did not announce the falling asleep of the elder to anyone. He himself had given that order. The abbess invited Father Nicholas, the captain, the chaplain of the Hezekasterion, and informed him that Father Paisio said, expressed the desire that Father Nicholas alone should conduct the funeral service. Father Nicholas acceded, acceded with fear mingled with joy, fear because he considered himself unworthy of conducting the funeral for a saint, and joy for the great blessing which God had granted him. The vigil began at the chapel of the archangels at 11 o'clock that night. After the Divine Liturgy, the funeral service took place. The sisters chanted the funeral hymns, feeling that the elder was still alive amongst them. One month earlier, he had jokingly said, I will chant the funeral service. Indeed, he had chanted in the con Congregation of the Saints. Psalm 149.1 It was as if he were saying, Yesterday, O Christ, was I buried with thee, and today I rise again with thy rising. Yesterday was I crucified with thee. Do thou thyself glorify me, O Savior, in thy kingdom. The second troparion of the third ode of the canon of the Holy and Great Sunday of Pascha. All the pain of the previous night had given way to the joy of the resurrection. In the dim light of the small chapel, the atmosphere was one of both crucifixion and resurrection. There were moments of parting, but the sorrow was transformed to joy because of the certainty that the saint will be at the side of each person who requests his intercession. The funeral procession to the burial site was carried out in absolute darkness. The only light came from a single torch which preceded the procession and two small humble lanterns which accompanied the elder. It was how he had, cho was, he had chosen to be buried. Throughout his entire life he had wanted to be concealed. His wealth was his personal inconspicuousness. It was also what he had arranged for his falling asleep. He had requested that it not be announced until three days had gone by. The venerable simplicity of the undisclosed burial made the luminous, glorified, and multitudinous presence of the triumphant church all the more perceptible. Immobile, the elder advanced in the darkness. And resplendent as he walked the blessed way, he was simultaneously met by the choirs of the righteous. The procession arrived at the place where his gra grave had been prepared. 
behind the sanctuary of the Church of St. Arsenios, which 20 years later was destined to become his church as well. By the light of a single candle, the prescribed prayers for internment were read. The designated Combeschini was also prayed, and the priest said, Christ is risen. Footnote, after the burial of a monastic, one Combeschini of 100 knots is prayed, Lord Jesus Christ, grant repose to the soul of your servant. St. Paisios is no longer suffering or in pain. He is no longer consumed by helping others or by consoling those in need. His philotimo filled and noble heart is no longer divided between his longing for the desert and his need to be near those who suffer. Now he flies readily like an angel from one end of the earth to the other. Just as he himself had written about St. Arsenios, and he is easily found everywhere, near every person who calls upon him with faith and reverence. As long as he lived upon the earth, the saint was humble and simultaneously grand, completely destitute and yet extremely wealthy, simple and barely literate, but wise and full of the Holy Spirit. At every moment of his life, as a young man with a monastic mindset in Konitsa, as a soldier, later in the maelstrom of war, as a struggling young monk in the holy monasteries of Esvigmenu and Philotheu, as the indefatigable monk with a capital M at the holy monastery of Stomion, as an incorporeal ascetic in the desert of Sinai, as a God-illumined elder who received thousands of people at the Kali of the Precious Cross and at Panaguda. He had always been on fire with the same flame to devote himself completely to God with a philotimo filled asceticism and to sacrifice himself for his fellow human beings with a truly noble love. He had indeed lived according to the gospel, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. He was a shining presence in the world through his good works. He glorified God with his holy life, and God in turn glorified him by accomplishing a multitude of miracles through him. The recorded lives of the saints describe their physical labors, the voluntary poverty, the fasting, the vigils, the abstinence, the patience. However, few of their spiritual labors are mentioned, and those are only seen dimly, as if in a mirror. Thus, by the same token, very little of the spiritual work of St. Paisios has been revealed. No one can say how deeply the saint had advanced in the ex excavation of the spiritual mind, nor to what spiritual heights he had risen. But if one had to choose just one word for what it was that had made St. Paisios become what he was, one would repeat as the saint himself had, Love, love, love. Love bestows prophecy. Love yields miracles. Love is an abyss of an illumination. From St. John Climacus, Ladder of Divine Ascent, step, step 30. Love is the ultimate degree in the divine ascent of the virtues. God is indeed love, to whom be praise, dominion, power, in whom is and was and will be the cause of all goodness throughout endless ages. Amen. Oh!
Yeah. Mm-hmm. 